Gracias, ya vamos a comenzar esta, uh, este, este foro, pero antes de eso quiero introducir a una, una miembro del equipo de la Comité de Recursos Naturales, a Margarita Varela, que les va a dar las instrucciones básicas sobre cómo vamos a conducir este, este foro. Margarita, si me da el favor. Sí. Buenas tardes, voy a comenzar a compartir con ustedes las instrucciones del día de hoy. Tendremos una serie de paneles que consisten de seis personas por panel. Aquellos con tickets para proporcionar comentarios públicos serán llamados por el personal del comité cuando su panel esté en turno. Cuando el panel esté llevándose a cabo, el comité invitará al panel a hacer comentarios de mi izquierda a mi derecha. También le pedimos que proporcione su nombre completo al comienzo de sus comentarios. Cada panelista tendrá cinco minutos por comentarios. Si bien el propósito de este foro es escuchar a los panelistas, al final de los comentarios de cada panel, todos los miembros del comité podrán dirigirse a ciertos panelistas con preguntas a aclarar. Habrá un cronómetro visible que indicará cuándo hayan concluido los cinco minutos de cada panelista. No es necesario que hable durante los cinco minutos completos. Sin embargo, si supera los cinco minutos, se le pedirá que finalice sus comentarios. Les agradecemos profundamente por asistir, porque es importante para los objetivos de transparencia y participación pública del comité que celebremos el encuentro de hoy. La entrada de todos será transcrita la cual se, podrá, se pondrá a disposición de los miembros del comité y se puede ingresar en el registro oficial de futuros procedimientos del Congreso sobre esta legislación. Es fundamental que se permita a los panelistas brindar sus comentarios sin interrupciones o expresiones de apoyo u oposición de la audiencia. No se tolerarán interrupciones exabruptos o expresiones de apoyo u oposición de la audiencia. Cualquiera que se niegue a cumplir cuando se le pida sentarse en silencio y observar respetuosamente el evento, será escoltado fuera del procedimiento de hoy. Chair Grijalva. Thank you very much. And uh, let me begin by saying good afternoon to everyone. I want to welcome you to this congressional public input forum held under the auspices of the Natural Resources Committee of the United States Congress. I'm Raul Grijalva, and I chair the Natural Resources Committee that has jurisdiction over the legislation relative to Puerto Rico's political status. The purpose of this forum is to listen to the people of Puerto Rico on the Puerto Rico Status Act discussion draft. The committee has invited panelists with specific perspectives and expertise relative to this important issue to address our delegation and share their views. Members of the public have also been asked to share their views as panelists during this afternoon's proceedings and the committee deeply, deeply appreciates those that we will hear from today and that took the time to register a speaking, for a speaking opportunity at today's proceedings. The committee is holding the, this forum to help inform the legislative process and Congress's action on the Puerto Rico Status Act, which I will speak, which, uh, many of you are familiar with, and we look forward to the information as it, it will impact us, our decisions going forward. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to stress that this forum is one of several uh, mechanisms the committee has made available to the public in Puerto Rico to share their views and perspectives on the legislation. Uh, I, I encourage stakeholders and, uh, and, and the people of Puerto Rico to that care about this issue to share their perspective with us on the committee's website at naturalresources.house.gov. Thank you. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, bienvenidos a este encuentro de opinión pública del Congreso realizando bajo el, bajo el Comité de Recursos Naturales del Congreso de los Estados Unidos. Soy Raúl Grijalva, presido el Comité de Recursos Naturales que tiene que tiene la autoridad sobre, sobre esta legislación relativa al estatus político de Puerto Rico. 
El comité está celebrando este encuentro para ayudar a informar el proceso y las acciones del Congreso sobre la, la ley para el estatus de Puerto Rico, de cual, de cual los detalles ya muchos conocen y es, esperamos uh, ser más informados sobre, sobre ese documento hoy basados en el comentario y las opiniones de los panelistas. Quiero uh, este encuentro no es, no es el único, hay otros uh, modos de comunicar con la comité, pero la urgencia de este día es para nosotros recibir inicialmente la opinión, las recomendaciones y, y también uh, la crítica que algunos ven con este documento. Es importante para el proceso. Hoy me, han, me acompañan mis colegas Nidia Velázquez y el Alexandria Ocasio Cortés de Nueva York y su congresista Jennifer González Colón. Quiero da, agradecerles a, a, profundamente a Velázquez, González Colón, Ocasio Cortés por su, de, por su dedicación a resolver esta cuestión en curso sobre el futuro de Puerto Rico. Y quiero agradecerles por, por el verdadero liderazgo que han mostrado en este asunto, que no ha sido un proceso fácil, ha sido un proceso difícil, con mucho riesgo, pero también la oportunidad histórica de tomar un paso al frente. Uh, les quiero dar las gracias a todos y con eso quiero reconocer a mi colega, uh, la comisaria de Puerto Rico, uh, congresista González Colón, por favor. Muchas gracias, señor presidente del comité, eh, a la compañera Anidia Velázquez, a la compañera Ocasio Cortés, que nos acompañan. Hoy es un día bien distinto. Pocas veces uno tiene el Comité de Recursos Naturales en la isla haciendo un foro de esta magnitud para discutir un asunto que nosotros como puertorriqueños venimos discutiendo hace muchas décadas. La realidad es que históricamente cada cual presenta sus medidas. En el caso nuestro, el pueblo de Puerto Rico votó ¿verdad? a favor de la estadidad para Puerto Rico en el 2012, en el 2017, en el 2020, lo que provocó el que radicáramos un proyecto en la Cámara, el HR 1522, que tiene eh, composición bipartita, y que a la misma vez la congresista Velázquez y la congresista Ocasio Cortés eh, radicaran el proyecto de la Cámara 2070. Ambos proyectos son parte de la evaluación de este comité que ha tenido vistas públicas en todo este proceso. Como parte de un esfuerzo real para descolonizar a Puerto Rico, nos decidimos sentar en una mesa junto al líder de la mayoría, Steny Hoyer, congresista Darren Soto, a quien excuso de esta vista, su staff está presente, al igual que eh, otros ¿verdad? compañeros, y, de, y decidimos hacer un, un borrador de proyectos en aquellas áreas en las que pudimos ponernos de acuerdo. No es un proyecto perfecto para ninguna de las ideologías, no es un proyecto perfecto para ninguno de los procesos, sin embargo, es el primer borrador que provee un mecanismo que a mi juicio tiene dos razones fundamentales. Una, que por primera vez Puerto Rico tenga un vehículo vinculante donde el Congreso de los Estados Unidos le permita al pueblo de Puerto Rico seleccionar opciones de estatus no coloniales, no territoriales, que nos permitan salir de la situación de discriminación indecorosa y colonial en la que vive el pueblo de Puerto Rico por las últimas décadas. Este proyecto, eh, este borrador de proyecto, cumple con esos dos preceptos. Hoy no es otra cosa que eh, continuar lo que se ha hecho el jueves, ayer, que se reunieron con los distintos partidos políticos, hoy con los partidos políticos nacionales, y qué mejor que tener el insumo de las personas que están a favor, en contra, o que pudieran representar las ideologías contraídas en el proyecto. Así que agradezco nuevamente al Chairman Grijalba, a los miembros del comité que están aquí y que han estado escuchando lo que el pueblo de Puerto Rico tiene que decir y eh, estoy eh, dando la bienvenida a los comentarios de la gente. Gracias y la, la representante Velázquez, por favor. Muy buenas tardes al pueblo de Puerto Rico y quiero agradecer al chairman Raúl Grijalba, a mis colegas a Jennifer González Colón, Alexandria Ocasio Cortés y Darren Soto. Como todos nosotros sabemos, Puerto Rico es una colonia de los Estados Unidos. 
Hace más de 100 años, los Estados Unidos invadieron a Puerto Rico y desde entonces el tema del estatus político de Puerto Rico ha sido un asunto inconcluso que siempre ha estado en issue. Estamos aquí porque estamos de acuerdo en que debemos avanzar un proceso de descolonización. El estado actual es insostenible, es injusto y es indigno. La espera por un cambio ha sido larga para las familias puertorriqueñas. Como ustedes saben, yo introduje un bill, un proyecto, uh, conjuntamente con la congresista Alexandria Ocasio Cortés. Y obviamente entiendo que era el mejor vehículo que proveía para una asamblea constituyente uh, donde fuera el pueblo que tuviera eh, participación directa en ese mecanismo y eh, para lograr eh, acuerdos necesarios con relación a definiciones de estatus, eh, planes de transición y otros temas que son sumamente importantes. Pero aquí estamos. Yo creo que estamos en un momento histórico donde por primera vez partes que estaban contrarias, que tenían una visión distinta de cómo descolonizar a Puerto Rico, nos hemos reunido para lograr un acuerdo. Yo siempre he querido que se provea un mecanismo democrático incluso, inclusive y transparente. El avanzar un proceso que le permitiera al pueblo y a todos los sectores tener una participación amplia, democrática y transparente no era el rechazo a una opción en particular, sino que se le diera participación a todos los sectores y a todas las opciones sin que la balanza estuviera uh, tilt para apoyar a una de las opciones. So, Estamos aquí porque es el pueblo de Puerto Rico el que va a tener las consecuencias o a enfrentar las consecuencias de la solución que democráticamente el pueblo así decida. Es responsabilidad moral del Congreso de los Estados Unidos de decirle al pueblo de Puerto Rico qué está dispuesto a ofrecer y negociar. Y aquí estamos proveyendo un proceso que va a ser vinculante y que va a tener tres opciones, la independencia, la estadidad y la libre asociación. Para que este borrador, y quiero indicar que insistí de que fuera un borrador, porque si queremos descolonizar a Puerto Rico, tenemos que empezar proveyendo un proceso donde el pueblo de Puerto Rico sienta que, hay, está in, que ha invertido en la construcción de ese proceso, un proceso que debe, ser, debe respetar el derecho a la libre participación y que las definiciones que están incluidas sean ampliamente difundidas que se provea mecanismo para que el pueblo de Puerto Rico y cada elector entienda las consecuencias de cada una de esas definiciones. Le quiero dar las gracias a todos los panelistas porque su participación va a contribuir a que el proyecto que sea introducido ante el Congreso de los Estados Unidos refleje las aspiraciones y los sueños del pueblo puertorriqueño. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Uh, voy a reconocer a, a mi colega, representante Ocasio Cortés, para su comentario. Muchas gracias y buena tarde. Uh, estamos aquí hoy porque después de más que 100 años uh, en, con Puerto Rico 
a, como un territorio de los Estados Unidos, el gobierno federal de, de los Estados Unidos es preparado a reconocer por la primera vez la relación con Puerto Rico, a, a reconocer esa relación es, a, a, colonial. Después de años de desastres, de María, de terremotos y también ahora con los desarrollos uh, del Corte Supremo, sabemos que estamos eh, en un momento en que tenemos que cambiar y desarrollar el papel y el estatus de el, nuestra isla de Puerto Rico. Hoy y el punto de hoy y nuestra misión hoy es oír del pueblo de Puerto Rico a construir un proceso transparente, inclusivo, de integridad y transparencia, en que cualquier persona en, en esta isla puede tener fe que este es un proceso que respecta el, el, el pueblo y la gente de Puerto Rico. Um, y con eso yo quiero agradecer a todos los panelistas que están aquí y agradecer a toda la persona que toda la persona la audiencia que está aquí a participar en ese proceso. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Uh, deja invitar a la, a la primera serie de panelistas, por favor, y vamos a comenzar con la de mi izquierda a la derecha y esa no es su opinión política, quiero decirle. Uh, y com pero comenzamos y muchas gracias. Conocemos el primer panelista, por favor. No está. Ok. Buenas tardes para a propósito de récord. Aníbal Acevedo Vilá, former governor and former resident commissioner. Uh, I'm here in that capacity as former governor and resident commissioner. Thank you for this opportunity. Although I take full responsibility for the statements, the ideas I will present. To a great extent, they're also supported by the steering committee of the Frente Puerto Ricanista. This draft bill, while not perfect, is a step in the right direction. I will make some general comments on the definitions put forward, but will use most of my limited time to make comments on the definition for free association. Regarding statehood, there is a need to clarify that the official language of daily businesses in the state government, especially the courts, will be in Spanish as well as it will continue to be the official language in public schools. That has been the representation made by the statehood party to the people of Puerto Rico. But Congress has demanded in the past that states wishing to be admitted to the union with different prevailing linguistic groups such as Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, and Louisiana adhere to certain English speaking guidelines. Sure. The bill must clarify this. Also, there is a need to have a clear transition plan at four statehood, especially regarding the negative economic consequences of federal income taxation. Regarding independence, there is no moral or political reason to impose upon those who decide to keep their U.S. citizenship a different set of rules uh, to transmit that citizenship to their children than those living in other foreign countries. Moreover, to establish a different set of rules will clearly be unconstitutional. The language on the bill is not clear about that. One of the most important elements of this draft is the inclusion of free association as a different status alternative from the other. But because this will be the first time in U.S. history that free association will be available to a territory that has been unincorporated for more than 100 years and whose citizens have been U.S. citizens by birth for more than 100 years, there needs to be more details on the definition and transition plan. Starting point. If the United States is willing to offer free association, it is because Congress has made the intelligent decision that this kind of relationship could benefit both. Therefore, the bill must include at least the elements that Congress is willing to consider as part of the negotiation of a compact of free association. Without those clear elements, Congress will be making an offer without any real context. The main issue regarding the definition of free association is citizenship. Free association means that the U.S. has some strong interest in Puerto Rico, obviously more than under independence. 
The right for Puerto Ricans to keep their U.S. citizenship should open the door to making that citizenship one of the bases of the compact. The current language on the bill is confusing. The final proposal should include language stating that the U.S. is willing to recognize the right to claim U.S. citizenship to those born in Puerto Rico from a U.S. citizen. The language saying that transmission of citizenship will be for the duration of the first agreement is a political poison pill with no legal or constitutional effect. It is well known that one Congress cannot oblige another one. If after 25 or 35 years of a compact of free association, a future Congress is willing to extend the automatic transmission of U.S. citizenship, nothing in this bill could limit them in the future. Therefore, that language must be deleted. The bill includes the same economic transition for independence and free association. Again, if you're offering free association, it's because you're making an intelligent decision that having a special close relationship with Puerto Rico is good for both. Therefore, the economic transition must be different than the one offered for independence. It is in the interest of the U.S. to guarantee its farmers, retail, and industrial sector free access to Puerto Rican market. Under independence, that's something that the government of the new republic will have to decide. But under free association, it, will be, it should be included in the bill that the permanence of a free and open market will be part of the new compact. Many independent countries use the U.S. dollar as its currency. There should be language clarifying that the U.S. will have no objection that the compact may include U.S. dollar as currency in Puerto Rico. And it's also in the interest of the U.S. under free association to maintain its current mutual defense understanding with Puerto Rico. If the U.S. is willing to offer free association, all these elements must be part of the offering, not only because they, are, they will benefit Puerto Rico, but because they are of the interest of the U.S. as well. Two final general comments. To move this process forward significantly, it must really become a bipartisan bill. And after more than two weeks since this draft has been made public, so far we haven't perceived much enthusiasm on the Republican side. From the meetings you had yesterday and the testimonies you will hear today, I'm sure you will get that this is a complicated process and that there are many details of the different options that need negotiation and fine tuning. That's why many people, myself, and those who are part of the Frente Puerto Ricanista still believe that the status convention as described in HR 27 is the best procedural option. You are trying to do in three days what the status convention and negotiation committee created by HR 27 will have to do with adequate timing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me invite the next speaker, please. First Gracias. Thank you. Thanks and foremost, I'd like to thank God for this opportunity. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this initiative. And of course, the champion uh, consensus bills, Chairman, um, Congresswoman Lydia Velasquez and Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, and of course, Alexander Caso Cortez. I'm going to switch to Spanish because I want to avoid any misquotation by the local press. <laughs> and my, people. my name, um, soy Soraida Urso. Soy la delegada congresional electa al Senado Federal. Y hoy comparezco ante ustedes como portavoz de dos organizaciones ciudadanas que han batallado por décadas para llevar el mensaje y educar sobre la estadidad como la mejor alternativa para la democracia plena para todos los puertorriqueños de la isla. Estos son los puertorriqueños Pro Unión Permanente Inc. y Acción Civil para el Estatus. Tras 124 años bajo la bandera americana, 105 años como ciudadanos americanos, 70 años con una constitución ratificada por el pueblo de Puerto Rico y avalada por ley federal, seis plebiscitos locales celebrados entre 1967 y el 2020. Finalmente, el Puerto Rico Status Act brinda a los ciudadanos de Puerto Rico el derecho para ejercer su autodeterminación por primera vez en la historia. Queremos destacar varios avances de esta pieza de consenso. En primer lugar, El proyecto es neutral en términos de que no favorece ninguna de las alternativas de estatus que reconoce la estadidad y la independencia en dos modalidades, con y sin tratado de libre asociación. En términos de política pública y luego de las decisiones del Tribunal Supremo que todos conocemos, el Congreso establece darle fin a la condición territorial, una condición antidemocrática que implica tratamiento desigual sobre los ciudadanos de esta isla en comparación con nuestros hermanos y hermanas que residen en los estados de la nación, incluyendo usted, Alexandro Ocasio Cortés, y usted, Nidia Velázquez. Priva a todos del derecho al voto por nuestro presidente o presidenta y por representantes electos en los cuerpos legislativos de la Cámara y el Senado Federal, donde se discuten y aprueban las leyes que nos afectan. 
es moralmente insostenible para una nación que se presenta al mundo como portaestandarte de la democracia, continuar manteniendo a 3.2 millones de ciudadanos americanos en una condición territorial de duración indefinida, de subyugación política y repudiada por la vasta mayoría de los gobernados en esta isla. Este proyecto instrumenta la terminación de la condición que ha causado injusticias que limitan nuestro desarrollo social y económico y que es una rémora del pasado imperialista con modelos coloniales. Por tanto, apoyamos la firme determinación de ustedes de empoderar a los ciudadanos residentes de Puerto Rico, liberándonos de la cláusula territorial de una vez y por todas y proveyendo opciones constitucionalmente viables. Esto es, otorgarle a Puerto Rico los poderes de la soberanía de un Estado al amparo de la décima enmienda de la Constitución Federal o, por otro lado, convertir a la isla en un país extranjero mediante el reconocimiento de la República de Puerto Rico con o sin tratado de libre asociación. No tenemos duda de que la progresión natural del territorio de Puerto Rico es hacia la estadidad. Esa es la verdadera culminación del estatus actual. El proyecto refleja de manera precisa los lineamientos de la estadidad. Correcta y acertadamente presenta que la única alternativa que garantiza la ciudadanía americana a los ciudadanos de Puerto Rico con todos sus derechos, derechos deberes y privilegios en condiciones de igualdad con los 50 estados de la nación y de forma permanente, es la estadidad. Esto no es el caso con las dos modalidades de independencia que el proyecto ofrece. Al disponer en sus secciones 109 y 208 que el estatus de ciudadanía de los nacidos en Puerto Rico quedaría en manos de lo que la República de Puerto Rico disponga en su constitución y sus leyes. En cuanto a la ciudadanía americana se refiere, provee trato distinto para los hijos nacidos con posterioridad a la declaración de soberanía independiente y que aquel hijo o hija que la desee tendría que atravesar por el engorroso proceso de naturalización establecido por ley federal como cualquier extranjero. En cuanto a la opción de libre asociación, cualquier representación de unión permanente o garantía de ciudadanía americana quedan derrotadas por el artículo 211 que dispone claramente que el tratado de libre asociación puede quedar sin efecto en cualquier momento por la voluntad de cualquiera de, los, de las dos partes. El proyecto es claro. Como parte de este proceso de reuniones, de discusiones y foro público, es de esperar que ustedes reciban múltiples peticiones para variar lineamientos que el proyecto establece y que evidentemente han estudiado exhaustivamente sus autores. Muy respetuosamente les pedimos que las evalúen cuidadosamente y que rehuyan todo lenguaje que cree falsas expectativas de los electores sobre aspectos tan importantes como la ciudadanía americana. Por más aclaraciones que pidan, la independencia con o sin libre asociación seguirá siendo un salto al vacío para todo el que crea en la unión permanente y en la preservación de ciudadanía americana, en la unión permanente y en la preservación de su ciudadanía con sus protecciones y garantías. Gracias. Respetuosamente solicitamos que radiquen la medida y obtengan para ella un apoyo bipartito contundente de sus colegas en el Congreso. Ustedes pueden lograrlo. Y sin dar ya, ni un ya, solo paso ya, atrás. Ya pasaron los cinco minutos. Muchísimas gracias. ¿Cómo no? sí. Siguiente persona, por favor. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María de Lourdes Guzmán. Soy presidenta del Movimiento Unión Soberanista, organización político-educativa que aboga por la soberanía para Puerto Rico desde las opciones de independencia y libre asociación. A nombre de la organización que presido, agradezco la invitación y la presencia de todos ustedes y su interés en que el asunto del estatus de Puerto Rico sea discutido. Este tema ha sufrido históricamente la indiferencia y la apatía del gobierno estadounidense a pesar de los reclamos legítimos de muchos sectores del país para que se atienda. Durante poco más de un mes se habrán de cumplir 124 años desde que Estados Unidos nos invadiera militarmente, haciéndole creer al pueblo que nos traería la libertad y la democracia que el régimen español nos negó por cuatro siglos. Mas hemos sido utilizados política, militar y económicamente para el beneficio de la potencia colonizadora, con el apoyo de quienes le han servido de incondicionales hasta nuestros días. Por más de un siglo hemos sido colonizados política, económica y psicológicamente. El día en que se cumplen 124 años de la invasión estadounidense, se cumplen 70 años de la creación de Lela, 
que ha resultado ser el disfraz del régimen colonial que vivimos, una realidad que el propio gobierno estadounidense se ha encargado de desenmascarar. Ambos acontecimientos deben llenar de profunda vergüenza al país que se precia de ser paradín de los derechos civiles, defensor de la libertad y la democracia. Gracias a Lela, Puerto Rico se ve impedido de comerciar con otros países, de controlar su inmigración, su aduana y sus fronteras, por donde llegan las drogas y las armas que auxilian al mercado del narcotráfico que sangra nuestro país. Estamos obligados a utilizar la marina mercante más cara y deficiente del mundo y nos hemos convertido en un país dependiente del mercado estadounidense, importando más del 85% de lo que consumimos. Cerca de la mitad de nuestra población vive en niveles de pobreza. Nuestra juventud, el, el tesoro de toda nación, solo ha conocido la precariedad. Nuestro acelerado, acelerado empobrecimiento ha expulsado del país a cientos de miles de puertorriqueños que no encuentran oportunidades para hacer realidad sus aspiraciones. Tras la colosal quiebra a la que nos sometieron colonialistas y anexionistas, se nos impuso una despótica junta de control fiscal que ha manejado nuestro presupuesto para beneficio de los bonistas especuladores, amenazando nuestra universidad, menoscabando el retiro de miles de trabajadores, nuestros servicios esenciales y nuestro derecho fundamental a una vida digna. Esto en apretada síntesis es lo que ha representado Lela para nuestro pueblo, una tétrica realidad que ustedes como protagonistas de este esfuerzo deben transmitir a sus compañeros congresistas. Ante lo complejo que resulta buscar el resolver problema del estatus de nuestro país y a pesar de que favorecemos el mecanismo de asamblea constitucional de estatus, aplaudimos este esfuerzo por lograr la redacción de este borrador que excluya como parte de la solución lo que ha sido y es definitivamente el problema, la opción territorial. Este borrador nos da la oportunidad de tener una discusión profunda, madura, seria, responsable, sin miedo, de un tema que nos mantiene divididos sobre nuestras preferencias, división que Estados Unidos ha utilizado de excusa para no hacer nada y plantear convenientemente que nos pongamos de acuerdo, rehuyendo su responsabilidad moral que le impone el haber ocupado nuestro país por más de un siglo y haberlo explotado para su beneficio. Aplaudimos que ante lo que ha sido la postura histórica de la rama ejecutiva del gobierno federal de defender la opción territorial, no solo a esta se descarte, sino que se incluya como opción separada la libre asociación que le da la oportunidad a nuestro pueblo desde el ejercicio de su soberanía de negociar un tratado de libre asociación con Estados Unidos como lo ha hecho ese país con otras islas del Pacífico. Nos parece un gran acierto el que en la independencia, el único derecho inalienable de los pueblos, se reconozca el derecho de los puertorriqueños al libre tránsito tránsito hacia Estados Unidos, considerando que las condiciones creadas bajo el ELA han forzado al exilio a más de 5 millones de puertorriqueños, ha desmembrado familias y nos ha convertido en una nación dividida. Mas entendemos que la definición de la estadidad debe elaborarse. Decir escuetamente que nuestros derechos están garantizados bajo la Constitución de Estados Unidos nos parece insuficiente. Su autoejecutabilidad es real. Sobre todo si se considera el hecho innegable de que la estadidad es una concesión que emana del Congreso de Estados Unidos, quien se reserva el derecho de imponer las condiciones de entrada a la Federación de Estados. Nada se dice sobre las responsabilidades contributivas que asumiríamos, ni sobre nuestro idioma, ni la viabilidad económica de un Puerto Rico Estado en situación de precariedad. Además, ¿es una mayoría del 50% más uno suficiente para garantizar la admisión? Por otro lado, los puertorriqueños merecemos saber que lo que realmente representa presenta mantenernos como territorio incorporado, previo a la admisión como Estado, lo que sería catastrófico para nuestro país. Ante la realidad ineludible de que Estados Unidos es artífice de Lela, lo que ha impedido nuestro desarrollo como pueblo, urge que se encamine un proceso de descolonización que nos saque del atolladero en que nos encontramos. Puerto Rico no puede seguir siendo rehén del inmovilismo. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Por favor. Sí. Eh, buenas tardes. Master. Le digo mis palabras a William Miranda Marín en el aniversario 12 de su muerte. Él hubiera estado aquí. My name is Ramon Luis Nieves. I am an attorney and former senator for the District of San Juan, Puerto Rico. For the past 25 years, I have advocated for free association as a status option for the people of Puerto Rico and the government of the United States. Even though I am a member and former senator of the Partido Popular Democrático, I appear before you in my personal capacity. That said, It is an undeniable fact that thousands of populares support free association. Also, for the past 32 years, the Partido Popular Democrático has formally advocated for a non-colonial, non-territorial association between Puerto Rico and the United States. I appear before you in support 
of the draft bill known as the Puerto Rico Status Act. This draft represents an important turning point in the colonial drama between Congress and Puerto Rico. The legislative intent of the draft is to propose non-colonial, non-territorial options to be voted by the people of Puerto Rico. Including or excluding territorial options on this draft is a policy decision made by Congress. I welcome the opportunity of starting a serious conversation on free association. This draft closes the door on misleading statements suggesting that free association is some kind of independence. El ataque de las supuestas dos independencias es realmente una mentira política. Lean el proyecto. Free association is perhaps the most flexible of status options. Understanding this fundamental characteristic of free association is critical. Political will is the only parameter to be followed in shaping a compact of free association between both nations. This draft fails to clearly distinguish between both options, free association and independence. It proposes basically the same terms regarding so-called withdrawal of US sovereignty. I propose that even though this language works under independence, the terms of free association actually become effecting, effective after formal, formal signing of the compact, its approval by the voters, a compact implement, implementation act, and a presidential proclamation. I will now address the controversial, the controversial issue of US citizenship in a compact of free association. Perhaps one of the most important myths destroyed by this draft is the alleged impossibility of continued transmission of US citizenship under free association. However, the draft imposes conditions on continued transmission of citizenship that make no sense on a free association scenario. Puerto Ricans, US citizens since 1917, wish to remain so and to retain their rights to further transmit such legal status to their sons and daughters. Continued transmission of US citizenship by Puerto Ricans under free association is a policy decision governed by political will and the terms of the, of the compact. There are no legal, constitutional, or significant policy, policy constraints on the United States agreeing on continued transmission of US citizenship after the effective date of the compact. Finally, I propose that the committee engages advocates of free association in the following days to further refine this draft. Respectfully, we cannot pretend this process to be serious if advocates for statehood insist on imposing conditions on free association while being quite vague on their preferred option. Perhaps that is why the draft is silent on critical issues such as federal taxation on their statehood. The impact of federal taxes on the recent plan of adjustment to deal with Puerto Rico's post-bankruptcy scenario and the issue of language. This, while including a nonsensical proposal on their free association to transfer social security funds of Puerto Rican individuals to the local government. I imagine that statehood advocates are already drafting copy for political attack ads using this nonsensical social security business. Self-determination principles require that Congress sits down with advocates of non-colonial, non-territorial options and offer the best possible and mutually agreeable conditions to the people of Puerto Rico. Muchas gracias. gracias. Let me invite the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joel. No, that, that is not on. Can't hear? No. Hello. Yeah. Now, okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joel Lavoy. Since I was a young girl, I've been a statehood supporter. Throughout my life and in different forums, I have been able to defend the belief that statehood is the best status option for Puerto Rico. Everywhere, from the Puerto Rico Senate to the United Nations, I have had the honor of being able to raise my voice on behalf of hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans that, like me, firmly believe Puerto Rico should become a state of the United States of America. Today, I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for putting your differences aside and making the well-being of Puerto Rico the priority. For the first time, after so many attempts, I really believe that we're closer to ending the current undignified status, enough like of being one. a colony. Like Regarding this draft, based on my experience as a former senator, I know that there is not such a thing as a perfect bill. 
but I am confident that coming to Puerto Rico to hear, not only from political leaders, but also from regular citizens like myself, will allow you to improve this bill. And for that, I thank you again. I want to take this opportunity to stress those points that I believe are the most important of Puerto Rico Status Act. With this draft, you have achieved five important things. One, to bring closer to resolution what we believe is the basis of our problems. We might be solving this issue once and for all within the next 17 months. Two, to exclusively include non-colonial, non-territorial status options. Three, to demand respect from Congress towards what we will, oh, towards what will be our decision, our land, our decision, and Congress will have to abide. Four, providing for the decision to be made through direct vote, through a democratic process, which will allow all Puerto Ricans to vote. And five, ensuring Puerto Ricans will be making an informed decision by validating the meaning and the consequences of each alternative through a nonpartisan voter educational campaign. Although I am confident that the majority will choose statehood, truth is that whichever status option wins, that is what we will become. I am pretty sure that one of the main key takeaways from this trip will be that Puerto Rico or Puerto Ricans want this problem to be solved. Our current status is the main reason our island has stalled in its full political, economic, and social development. That is why I believe that those who live in this island cannot leave all the work in your hands. It is obvious that this bill will be challenged by many Congress or members of Congress, particularly from the Republican Party. And that is why, as a Puerto Rican, I know that many of us will ask from our many family members and friends who have had to leave the island, not out of choice but necessity, to become actively involved in the support of this bill. We will ask from them to call their congressmen and women and senators to demand their support for the approval of this bill, making this an important issue for the upcoming elections. And due to limitation of time, I will only add one more aspect, actually a request to all of you. As mentioned, I have been an elected official, those I know that too many times decisions are supported by some and rejected by others. But our duty as representatives of the people is to make decisions based on what we believe is the right thing to do, regardless of the support or rejection. So my ask, do not give in to demands from a group of people, including leaders, who insist on not resolving our status, who insist on having the ELA as an option. As so many of us know, to include what we suffered today will only result in keeping Puerto Rico hostage of an anti-democratic state where others make decisions for us without the right to have a say or a vote. Let me finish by saying, I am a very proud grandmother of two, and based on decisions made at the federal level, I worry about their future. This horrendous tendency to, tie, to try to take away rights, abortion, to just to mention one, from minorities is dangerous. It is because of Valentina and Diego, my grandchildren, and all our children in Puerto Rico, that I know that today, more than ever, we cannot be excluded from the right to representation and vote. Thank you. We're counting on you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir. Good evening. Buenas tardes. For the record, I am Brigadier General Retired Victor Perez, President of the Veterans for Puerto Rico Statehood. Our group visited Congress this past 25, 30 April and had audience with 35 representatives and senators lobbying for Puerto Rico Statehood. And we stand ready to go again. We all agree, thank God and Congress, 
Finally, Puerto Rico colonial status will come to an end, voted by Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. We thank Honorable Hoyer, Honorable Guijarba, Honorable Velasquez, Honorable Ocasio, our resident commissioner, Honorable Gonzalez, and our, and our governor, Honorable Perwisi, for coming together and marking history, present, presenting the soon-to-be bill, the Puerto Rico Status Act, binding Congress to conduct and accept a referendum in Puerto Rico, voted by, by Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico to choose between non-colonial, and I repeat, non-colonial options of independence, free association, and statehood. This is the express will of the people, and that is what we want. After 125 years of being a territory colony of the United States, we finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. We have debated this subject throughout those 125 years enough to conclude that we are hearing from Congress in this Puerto Rico Status Act. Puerto Rico is a colony that we will not uh, hide it anymore, and it needs to be resolved for the good and prosperity of the 3.2 million Puerto Ricans living in this island, as well as the other five millions, among them many veterans, who have moved to, the, to one of the 50 states looking for equality. How ironic can it be for Puerto Rican veterans living in Puerto Rico that we do not have the, the same rights that our, far, that our, our fellow comrades in arms in the states. Listen to this. For all of us that have served and continue to serve, there is no greater honor than to serve our nation, the United States of America. We have done it in the past, and we will continue to do so proudly, selflessly, and without hesitation. More than 250,000 Puerto Ricans have honorably and bravely served our nation throughout its history, all wars, all contingency. Per capita, Puerto Rico has have, have served more than many other states. Nine Puerto Ricans have been recognized with the Medal of Honor, the highest uh, the distinction presented by the President of the United States to any service member. Our 65th Infantry, Infantry Regiment, who fought in World War II and Korea, was recognized by Congress with the Congressional Gold Medal, as said by President Obama, who signed the same. My hand has more fingers than the amount of Congressional Gold Medals given by Congress. Today, over 100,000 veterans live in this island. Approximately 35,000 men and women currently serve in the armed forces worldwide. Yet, even after all our service and sacrifice defending democracy, liberty, and justice, we come back home, Puerto Rico, and we are denied full voting rights and equality which the U.S. Constitution guarantees to all citizens living in the States. How can this be? We are sent to war. We have no choice. We fight. We sacrifice ourselves and our families. Many of us do not return. But when we come back to Puerto Rico, we cannot vote for the president, our commander in chief, nor we have representation with, both, with voice and vote in Congress. They send us to war. You send us to war. We don't have a resident commissioner, Honorable Jennifer Gonzalez, who you know very well. She is very vocal. She is a great congresswoman. She has a great voice, but she don't have a vote. The only income for many veterans, as well as Puerto Ricans living in the island, is Social Security. But yet, as ratified by the U.S. Supreme Court, Congress can discriminate against Puerto Ricans living in Puerto Rico not to receive supplemental security income, SSI. Clearly discrimination in a matter of human rights. Puerto Rico is being a territory of the United States, is part of the border, as it's part of the continent, but incredibly, and, at, and for the matter of TRICARE, we are treated as a foreign country. We do not receive the same Medicare or we don't receive the same federal funds as many other states. So why is this? Because we are a colony for all veterans, for all service members, for all 3.2 million Puerto Ricans living in Puerto Rico, this cannot continue, and Congress is finally acting now. Mira, gracias por estar actuando ahora mismo. Thank you 
for giving this Puerto Rico Status Act and uh, the binding and colonial decisions by Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. God bless our veterans and service members. God bless Puerto Rico. God bless our nation, the United States of America. Do you have any questions for me? I couldn't cut you off in the middle of a God bless. You know, that would have been very, very <laughs> bad of me. But uh, uh, no, let me, uh, no, I, I don't have any questions for the panels other than my friend uh, to thank you for your service and the men and women uh, I am from Puerto Rico. Very, very, very and thank them as well. The audience here today. Thank them as well with, uh, with respect and admiration. Uh, any questions for the panelists? Let me turn to my colleagues. I don't have any. I don't have any. Okay. Um, I uh, have one question. Um, Please. For Senor Anibar Alcevedo Vila, you had mentioned uh, an assertion about um, clarification regarding maintaining uh, the official language as Spanish in the event of a statehood option. Are there any other linguistic or cultural um, ascertainments that you would like to, that, that you wanted to point out, or is it solely language? Well, I'm against statehood. I just want to let you know that the way the statehood party has presented to the people of Puerto Rico the alternative of, of uh, statehood, it means that nothing is going to change in terms of our culture and identity. Sometimes they even said that we, we might be able to keep our Olympic team because the Olympic teams is a, the, the, uh, a private organization, the International Olympic Committee. And, and so, so language is the more clear one because you have in the past experiences, and I mentioned some of the state. If you look into the uh, Admission Act of those states, Congress back then said, you have to guarantee that public schools are going to be in English. You have to guarantee that the legislative process is going to be in English. So being silent on that issue, I don't think it would be fair for the people of Puerto Rico to vote for statehood and then later okay. on realize that uh, what we have today, okay. which is, and I'm going to give you an example. God bless you. But if you have a car accident here in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and we have to take you to court, we're going to try you in Spanish. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you a translator, but it's going to be in Spanish. And they may believe, the people of Puerto Rico, that if we become a state, that's going to be the case. That the courts are going to be in Spanish and everybody. Yeah. So that's the main issue. But the whole issue how to protect the identity, okay. the sense that we're unique. That's, that's one of the problems with, with statehood. And I'd like to just open the opportunity um, for any other witnesses regarding language and culture as part of any of the uh, status options presented in the draft legislation. You're all invited to comment if you, if I'm okay. correctly reading uh, Mr. Casi Cortez's intention. All, I think any panelist who wants to speak to the issues of language, identity, or culture is please. Bueno, yo creo que es un asunto como yo mencioné en mi ponencia que debe eh, abordarse porque hay muchos mitos con relación a lo que sería el estado de Puerto Rico. Nosotros en Puerto Rico, el 90% de nuestra gente habla español. Decir que somos bilingües no es correcto. Y en Estados Unidos se habla inglés independientemente de que se diga de que no hay un idioma oficial, se habla inglés. Nuestros hermanos y hermanas puertorriqueñas se mudan a los Estados Unidos y deben hablar inglés. Hablan español en sus casas, en sus comunidades, pero la realidad es que para insertarse en el mercado laboral y en el resto de lo que significa la sociedad estadounidense, deben hablar inglés incluyendo las escuelas a las que van los niños. Y me parece que hay una laguna ahí y por eso hablo de que se debe discutir esto con mucha madurez, con mucha responsabilidad, sin meterle miedo a la gente de que vamos a perder esto, aquello, lo otro, pero que una de las cosas que sí podríamos perder es nuestro idioma. If I, if I may, uh, in Espanol or in English, it doesn't make a difference. But as far as I understand, there's no official language in the United States. So at the end, we wouldn't be required, as far as I understand. But I do believe, though, and I have to. But, but, but if I may, but if I may, if there's one thing that I love about this bill is that, or no. this draft, is that nobody's going to be lied to. So I'm going to have to 
join their request. And I think that, again, starting from the point that there's no official language, we do need to take a look at this and any other doubt. Because at the end, that campaign that you guys are going to do for the voters need to be clear as to every aspect for each mm -hmm. and every of the, of the options. Thank you. Uh, sí. Yes, Velázquez. I have a short question. Uh, sobre la to, misma pregunta, sobre to, el mismo tema. No, otro, otro tema. Si me permite expresarme en relación a ese tema. Por favor. Sí. Los Estados Unidos es una nación multicultural. Estar pensando que los Estados Unidos va a ser en, este, en, este, en el siglo XXI una nación que va a imponer un solo idioma sobre un pueblo es una falacia. Sencillamente es una total desconexión con la realidad que se está viviendo. En adición, la cuestión del idioma es uno de los derechos que reserva los si estados el, bajo por favor, la décima enmienda. Si me permite, por favor, yo sé que cada uno tiene su modo de expresarse de, de, de la opinión que están escuchando y del apoyo a esa opinión, pero si me hacen el favor para poder... Uh, seguir con, esta, con este encuentro en un modo profesional, el aplaudo, los comentarios uh, públicos, resistir eso pues, si es posible. Mi uh, Nidia, you had a question. Yes, uh, either to Mr. Ramón Luis Nieves or uh, Aníbal Acevedo. So, what would be, in your opinion, a couple of examples of areas where the U.S. will keep jurisdiction in a free associated Puerto Rico. Well, uh, first of all, I, I think that precisely one of the problems with the draft is that it fails to identify some of those areas. Mm -hmm. For instance, the bill doesn't address what are the uh, security uh, obligations of the U.S under free association, for instance. Uh, it, it's silent on that subject, for instance. That's very important. However, I propose that maybe this bill is not a place to legislate a whole, the whole compact of free association. That's another process. Thank uh, you. And this is very important to, to identify that. Uh, and I, I understand that people are, some people are, could be worried that we could be voting for something that uh, we don't have the whole details of the compact. And that, that's fair to, to be preoccupied with that. But uh, it is, we have to at least include several areas that are missing there. And we can work with the, with the, with the committee and with, the, with Congress in order to address that. Yep. And very important, the, however, the areas that are mentioned on the bill uh, are quite similar in, regarding independence and free association, as I said it in my testimony. and. Uh, in some areas, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, in, under independence, after a presidential proclamation as proposed by the bill, mm -hmm. Puerto Rico's independent. That's not the process under free association. And Congress has already done several, uh, has authorized several compacts of free association, has authorized the renegotiated terms of those compacts, and maybe we can learn from that experience, but apply it to our experience here in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I want to address the, the, the question that was directed to both of us. Uh, I mentioned some of the areas on, on, my, on my testimony, but it has to be, we have to identify those who are for mutual benefit, both for the United States and, and, and for Puerto Rico. And the starting point should be the compact of free association that the United States has with the islands in the Pacific. All of the areas I mentioned here are part of those compacts. So it makes no Ooh. sense to offer the people of Puerto Rico and the alternative of free association and don't start even with what already has worked for the U.S. and those islands. It's common defense has been there. They use the dollar. You know, so, so how, how in terms of international relations, of course, Puerto Rico will have its own personality, but maybe the United States would like to have some way in terms because we are not independent. It's a free associated alternative. So the starting point should be the compact of free association and then sit down okay. and identify the, the other areas. Thank Ch you. Chairman, uh, very quickly, if I may, very quickly. Yeah, you, uh, this panel is going to take longer than the other five, but please. Okay, very quickly, very good. One area which is critical for Puerto Rico 
under the concept of security is the area of, of drug enforcement. 80% of the drugs that come here to Puerto Rico go to the United States. This is a national problem of the United States, which Puerto Rican people are dying every day on the streets. But that's one of the areas. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back. Is there anybody? M Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, Please. it's 10 seconds. And it is that under the 10th Amendment, the state reserve the right to select the language. Thank you. Now we're going to invite the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Good way. Okay. Let me welcome uh, the next panel and thank you very much. Por favor, por favor, algo de cortesía. Por favor. Por favor, si los permiten seguir con este encuentro, la, la opinión, cada persona aquí está en acuerdo con esa posición. Por, la cortesía de dejar este encuentro que siga, por favor. ¿Ya? Vamos a tener un receso de 10 minutos, por favor. So they can get them out. Ready? We're, uh, podemos comenzar de nuevo, por favor. Y muchas gracias. Uh, muchas gracias. Es que la democracia no todo el tiempo es bella, pero es necesaria. Y uh, la opinión y la protesta, respeto el derecho, pero también el derecho de tener este encuentro. Con, esta, con la seriedad de la cuestión enfrente de nosotros, aprecio eso también. Bueno, uh, muchísimas gracias. Por favor. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Natalia Catoni. I speak on behalf of the Puerto Rico John Republican Federation. I've given a lot of thought to what I'm going to say today. 
and I'll settle on giving a very brief understanding of the bill and what I believe, uh, and that I believe that the draft should be formally introduced to the committee and be voted for. I don't aim to be obvious about my pro-statehood stance, which I am very much pro-statehood, but at the end, I am a millennial. Um, I believe that my personal context will provide some idea of why I believe this bill should be introduced and why it's an opportunity for my generation to be heard. I was born into a pro-status quo, pro-colonial family. To give you an idea, my mother's childhood home became the Popular Democratic Party headquarters in the municipality of Vega Baja. My first political rally was the 1996 uh, campaign closure for the Popular Democratic Party, and I was part of the fifth column against statehood rallies, all of them. My mom took me to all of them. But with time, when I started to learn how to think for myself and I started seeing different things, my perspective changed, my political perspective changed. I have studied the topic and I understand that in the 1950s, my mother's generation, my grandparents' generation had the opportunity to express themselves through a democratic congressional approved process in which they voted and they were heard and the status quo was imposed. My generation has lived under a political status that was imposed to us that we have not chosen and that we all know is wrong. Colonialism is old and it's bad. My generation deserves a right to be heard regarding the political status. I'm not going to say that the bill is perfect. It's not. I have my opinions on whether things should change or not, but I do agree with two things. Number one, it's binding, and number two, the current status is not included, and it should never be included. Puerto Rico needs to move forward, and it needs to move forward now, so this bill should be properly introduced, and then we should go through the proper democratic process and all be heard and all allow for changes in the bill, but it needs to be introduced. With that, I give you my thanks. Very short statement. Thank you very much. Sir? Antes de hablar, tengo que manifestarme y decir que como puertorriqueño me siento muy apenado por el incidente que acaba de suceder aquí. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of this committee. For the record, I am Carlos Vizcarron de Rizarri, former Speaker of the House of Representatives and former Judge of the Court of Appeals of Puerto Rico. Today, I would like to address this committee regarding Title II, Transition and Implementation of Sovereignty in Free Association with the United States. First, I want to state for the record that in the years I participated in active politics in the Popular Democratic Party, I always favored the enhancement of the present Commonwealth status towards a relationship of autonomy between Puerto Rico and the United States in accordance with international law. More precisely, I was the author of a proposal to define the Commonwealth alternative to be defended in a future plebiscite, which was proposed to be held in 1991. The PDP was in control of the executive and legislative branches. Governor Rafael Hernández Colón, who chaired the PDP, gathered the party in a general assembly held in the 17th of November 1990 in Ponce, Puerto Rico, and submitted my proposal to vote, which was approved by an overwhelming majority. My proposition stated, required that the statute project makes oh. viable the exercise of free determination of the people of Puerto Rico on the laws of the Commonwealth between political and formulas of equal dignity not subordinated to the plenary powers of Congress of the United States on the territorial clause of the Constitution to be presented to the people of Puerto Rico by the Congress of the United States. Since 19, 
90, the PDP has recognized this proposal to be its official position regarding the enhancement of the Commonwealth status. In my opinion, the referred enhancement of the Commonwealth status is perfectly consistent with a proposition of sovereignty for the people of Puerto Rico in a compact of free association with the United States like the one you are uh, presenting to, no, to us in discussion draft before us. Finally, I want to summarize my more important recommendations. Add a new subsection D to section 207 to establish a court of the, court of the compact. I explained it in details in my written statement. Second, clarify is, uh, section 208 to state that U.S. citizenship living in Puerto Rico at the time of the proclamation of a free association will continue to be citizens of Puerto Rico and citizens of the United States. And third, clarify subsection A2 with respect to the persons born in the free associated state of Puerto Rico from Paris who are both U.S. citizens. They will acquire U.S. citizenship automatically. Fourth, request that the government of the U.S. abide to its legal obligations pertaining to the uh, services related to the vested rights of American citizens in Puerto Rico instead of referring those services to, the pro to be provided by the government of Puerto Rico. And finally, demand the same treatment given to, by the Social Security Administration to American citizens living outside the jurisdiction of the U.S. to the American citizen living in the free associated state of Puerto Rico instead of referring those services to the government of Puerto Rico. Mr. Th uh, Chairman, I'm grateful for this opportunity to address to the committee. Thank you. Muchas gracias. And let me turn to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lisa Munoz, and I am the president of the Young Democrats of Puerto Rico. First and foremost, I would like to thank you, Chairman Grijalva, for allowing me to address the members of the committee. I also wish to commend Congresswomen Jennifer Gonzalez and Nidia Velasquez for putting aside their ideological differences and working on a consensus bill to establish a federally binding process that will finally allow the Americans who live on these islands of Puerto Rico to have our voices heard in Congress about the type of political relationship we aspire to achieve with the United States, which I firmly believe will be statehood. I would also like to recognize Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio presence today and her steadfast support for young people and for this process. A large majority of us, the 3.2 million Americans who live in the oldest colony in the world, believe in decolonizing Puerto Rico and that we must continue causing good trouble to achieve our full civil rights. The national platform of the Young Democrats of America recognizes our desire for political equality and states as follows. We believe Congress must act on the will of the people of Puerto Rico and approve an enabling act with terms for Puerto Rico's admission as a state of the union. The people of Puerto Rico have exercised their right to self-determination, resulting in overwhelming support for statehood. Thus, we support granting the full admission of Puerto Rico as a state of the union. YDPR believes that our rights as American citizens should fully secured and that no American in this great country of ours should have to choose between remaining in the land of their birth or the opportunity for a better life in some faraway land. As has been well documented, Puerto Rico has been suffering from a major brain drain since our recession began in 2006, which has only worsened after Hurricane Maria. According to the 2020 census, over 300,000 people between the ages 25 and 65 have left our shores. My peers continue to seek a better quality of life and struggle with job, health, and food security after the COVID crisis. And we believe that if Puerto Rico were a state, we would not feel the need to seek better opportunities away from our families. We are tired of being treated worse than any other American in the nation. If Puerto Rico were to become a state, we would have the political power to have our voices truly heard in our nation's capital when legislation is being considered and approved in Congress. For example, our current colonial disenfranchisement silences the voices of the women of our islands 
on the matter of reproductive rights. It silences everyone in our island on the matter of climate change, which has severely impacted our coast during the past five years. There may very well be parts of these islands that will be underwater by the time I'm eligible to receive our second class Medicare benefits. As the daughter of a Bronx raised US Army Purple Heart recipient, Vietnam veteran, may he rest in peace, and as a type one diabetes patient since I was six years old, I can give testimony of the immense suffering that our family has had to endure because of the discrimination that the Congress and the federal government have imposed upon us by limiting our access to federal health care and other social programs. This discriminatory treatment and the burden that it has placed on the very people that these programs are meant to assist have had a cascading effect on the ability of quality health care for and of the social well-being of all Americans in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has been a colony of the United States for 124 years. This is the longest any, any territory has gone without being admitted into the Union. This is not just morally wrong, it is plainly un-American and our country, through its leaders like yourselves, needs to rid itself of this stain in its moral fabric. In the words of President Kennedy, I beseech you to not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. The right answer is equality through statehood for the 3.2 million Americans that call these beautiful islands their home. The consensus reached between the Puerto Rican members of this Congress contained in the federally binding status legislation being considered okay. by this committee is a step in the right direction. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Sir, recognize. Mi nombre es Rolando Emanuel y, y comparezco en mi carácter personal por mi conocimiento en la ley promesa y por mi experiencia como abogado litigante en los casos de título 3 de la ley promesa. Entre los méritos del proyecto resalto el esbozo de las definiciones y del proceso de transición hacia la independencia. En cuanto a los aspectos negativos, es imprescindible recalcar que el borrador contiene la semilla de su propia destrucción que hará imposible su aprobación en el Senado de los Estados Unidos. Esta semilla es la estadidad. Por tanto, si se quiere trabajar este proceso de una manera confiable y que resuelva de una vez y por todas la ignominia de nuestra situación colonial, el Congreso tiene que tomar una determinación inicial previa a aprobar este proyecto sobre la viabilidad de prometer la estadidad para Puerto Rico. Sin esa determinación de umbral, todos estaremos perdiendo el tiempo. Por otro lado, la Junta de Procónsules impuesta por la ley promesa, acaba de confirmar un plan de ajuste de la deuda para el gobierno central. El plan de ajuste tiene deficiencias y problemas que pueden resultar en que Puerto Rico termine en una segunda quiebra, pues los estimados de crecimiento que preparó la propia Junta se entierran en territorio negativo a partir del año 2024. Con este plan, el servicio a la deuda asciende a 3.350 millones de dólares anuales considerando el pago de los pensionados, que, que también son acreedores. Un Puerto Rico colonial no podrá recaudar por mucho tiempo los 3.350 millones anuales para el servicio a la deuda. Tampoco debe permitirse la injusticia y violación del derecho internacional de que un Puerto Rico soberano tenga que soportar y eventualmente colapsar ante una deuda colonial odiosa. El plan de ajuste de la deuda de Puerto Rico no es viable porque promete demasiados recursos para el pago de la deuda en un escenario colonial de mínimo o cero crecimiento económico. El Nobel de Economía Joseph Stiglitz ha dicho reiteradamente en sus visitas a Puerto Rico que un país que no crece económicamente no puede pagar la deuda y que un 50% de los países que ajustan su deuda vuelven a incumplir en sus pagos dentro de cinco años. La gota que colma la copa es que el plan de ajuste de deuda le ató las manos al régimen colonial de Puerto Rico, pues enmendó la constitución del Estado Libre Asociado, cambió los sistemas de retiro a uno de aportaciones definidas que al final del camino serán insuficientes para sostener a los retirados futuros y prohíbe, al menos por 10 años, el mejorar la situación de los pensionados o restituir los sistemas de pensiones de beneficios definidos. 
estas condiciones limitarían la soberanía de Puerto Rico para lidiar con la pobreza y desigualdad de nuestros retirados, por lo que no pueden ser parte de su Estado de Derecho. Recuerden que para, la, para que la República pueda ser viable tiene que redactar una Constitución nueva. Así lo contempla el borrador que nos ocupa. Esta Constitución podría definir la deuda odiosa y establecer su prohibición de pago, lo que daría paso a que las leyes que habilitan los bonos sean declaradas inconstitucionales. La deuda de Puerto Rico es odiosa, pues por su origen, proceso y ejecución fue emitida contraria a los intereses del pueblo de Puerto Rico. En primer término, el coloniaje es un crimen internacional y esta deuda se emitió bajo los auspicios del régimen colonial. En segundo término, se emitió en violación a las leyes locales y federales y a sabiendas de que era impagable. Finalmente, la deuda es ilegítima, pues se utilizó para refinanciar deuda con el propósito de mantener a flote el aparato colonial de Puerto Rico. Si quieren ver la prueba de esto, vean el famoso informe de Cobre and Kim que hizo la Junta de Control Fiscal, que documenta todo este escándalo. Esta deuda es ilegal e impagable y un Puerto Rico soberano no la debe pagar. El borrador del proyecto de ley debe tener disposiciones específicas que liberen a la República de Puerto Rico de los efectos de la deuda odiosa. Irónicamente, la deuda odiosa solo podría mantenerse si Puerto Rico se convierte en un Estado federal, pues la estadidad es la culminación del coloniaje y la constitución de Lela continuaría vigente y vinculada por ese plan de ajuste. Como Estado, estaríamos condenados a pagar y en su momento el gobierno federal tendría que manejar este problema cuando el Estado de Puerto Rico vuelva a incumplir con sus pagos a los acreedores. Es impostergable que el Congreso asuma cualquier responsabilidad establecida en el plan de ajuste de la deuda. No es posible llevar a cabo la descolonización de Puerto Rico si la República de Puerto Rico tiene que cargar con el peso de una deuda odiosa e insostenible. Sin esas reparaciones, cualquier proceso de descolonización estará abocado al fracaso. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Señor. Buenas tardes. Señor Presidente Grijalva, miembros del comité, mi nombre es Néstor Duprey. Sometí mi ponencia tanto en inglés como en español para beneficio de nuestros compatriotas. Voy a leer la misma en español. Agradezco la invitación que me hiciera este comité para compartir con ustedes unas breves reflexiones en torno al borrador del proyecto de ley sobre el futuro de las relaciones entre Puerto Rico y Estados Unidos que se encuentra ante su consideración. En primer lugar, quiero dejar meridianamente claro que mis opiniones y comentarios reflejan los dictados de mi conciencia y mi mente y solo me representan a mí en tanto historiador y científico político puertorriqueño. Creo en el reconocimiento de la soberanía puertorriqueña bajo un pacto, tratado o convenio de libre asociación entre los pueblos de Puerto Rico y los Estados Unidos de América, a quienes vincula una historia común de más de 100 años y unos lazos humanos, geográficos y económicos que obligan, a pesar de la realidad colonial, a un mutuo entendimiento que resuelva precisamente el carácter colonial de la relación actual. La libre asociación no es una opción huérfana de apoyo, sino que cuenta con el respaldo de puertorriqueñas y puertorriqueños, que más allá de líneas partidistas, la reconocen como el mejor camino para el pueblo de Puerto Rico en su relación con Estados Unidos. He defendido y defiendo la libre asociación no por conveniencia, sino por convicción, y por eso estoy aquí. En segundo lugar, creo es de justicia agradecer el interés tanto del presidente de este comité, el representante Grijalva, como del portavoz de la mayoría, Stanley Hoyer, en que se lograra un documento de consenso entre las medidas presentadas por la comisionada residente, querida amiga Jennifer González, y las representantes Nidia Velázquez y Alexandria Ocasio Cortés. Este documento, que esperamos se plasme en legislación en los próximos días, es el punto de partida de aquí en adelante, en la ineludible negociación que culmine en un proceso de mutua determinación sobre el futuro de la relación entre Puerto Rico y los Estados Unidos. Hablo de mutua determinación y no de libre determinación porque las decisiones de política pública que se verán reflejadas en esta legislación a discutirse y aprobarse eventualmente por el Congreso expresarán determinaciones de política pública del gobierno federal 
así como la voluntad del pueblo de Puerto Rico. Existen tres asuntos medulares que requieren, a mi modo de ver, una determinación de política pública del gobierno federal, a policy decision, y que afectarán el contenido final de la presente legislación actualmente en estado de borrador. El cómo se atiendan estos asuntos condicionarán la respuesta del pueblo de Puerto Rico a ese ofrecimiento de opciones constitucionalmente viables. Primeramente, el proyecto de ley en consideración obliga a que Estados Unidos decida que la política hacia el territorio de Puerto Rico por su extensión poblacional y las particularidades de la relación requiere un trato distinto a los demás territorios en cuanto a posibilidad de mantener la opción territorial, lo que para otros territorios es deseable y hasta conveniente por sus particularidades e intereses para los puertorriqueños es indeseable e inviable ya, y me sospecho que para los Estados Unidos también. La opción territorial bajo cualquier nombre es contraria a los mejores intereses del pueblo de Puerto Rico y retrasa para los Estados Unidos la solución de su problema, cómo disponer del territorio ofreciendo opciones descolonizadoras. En segundo lugar, los Estados Unidos como gobierno, a través de sus ramas políticas, tiene que decidir si ofrece la opción de estadidad para Puerto Rico con compromiso de otorgarla y bajo qué términos y condiciones. La disposición de autoejecutabilidad que contiene este borrador conlleva explícitamente la aceptación de una petición de admisión del territorio de Puerto Rico como Estado de la Unión sin que antes se conozcan los términos y condiciones de esa admisión. Y todos sabemos que esa cláusula de autoejecutabilidad ha sido el cementerio donde reposan los esfuerzos pasados en promover legislación para atender este problema. Y en tercer lugar... La opción de soberanía para Puerto Rico en la independencia o en la libre asociación implica una decisión de política pública del gobierno federal en torno al futuro de la ciudadanía norteamericana de los puertorriqueños. Todo es posible, todo es acordable si existe voluntad política para ello. Esos son, a manera de resumen, mis comentarios a la medida. Los pueblos de Puerto Rico y Estados Unidos tenemos que decidir el futuro de nuestra relación de una manera que reconozca nuestros mutuos intereses. Este proyecto es un paso en la dirección correcta. La conversación en, ha comenzado, hay que seguir. Gracias. Por favor. Eh, para el récord, voy a hablar en español y también con lenguaje inclusivo. Eh, saludos, estimadas congresistas y al personal del Comité de Recursos Naturales de la Cámara de Representantes de los Estados Unidos. Muchas gracias por darme la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes en el día de hoy. Mi nombre es Karina Claudio Betancourt, soy residente de San Juan, Puerto Rico, y como mucha gente joven y queer en esta isla, vivo los estragos del colonialismo a diario. En esta colonia no vivimos, sobrevivimos. Es un constante negociar entre la mediocridad de la austeridad y los recortes de servicios impuestos por la Junta de Control Fiscal y el deseo de realmente ser feliz y vivir plenamente en este país. Y creo que esto es realmente una de las cosas que más duelen de ser una persona joven en esta colonia. La amamos, la atesoramos, defendemos férreamente sus playas, como vieron en el día de hoy, y su tierra, nuestro derecho a ser y amar y a ser quienes somos, ¿verdad? Pero la colonia nos ahorca. Entonces yo creo que en este panel estamos de acuerdo que el problema de la colonia es insostenible. Y es por esto que me uno a la conversación acerca del Puerto Rico Status Act. Porque entiendo que ya es hora de resolver el problema y la situación colonial de Puerto Rico, pero también les exhorto a ustedes a que este proceso no sea uno acelerado y que por el contrario no se repitan los mismos errores que con promesa cuando de manera no democrática se nos impuso una junta que nos ha hecho miserables. Aunque agradezco personalmente y en nombre de la organización que represento, la Fundación Open Society, el liderazgo de la congresista Nidia Velázquez, Alexandre Ocasio Cortés, eh, por empujar ¿verdad? por un, un, eh, una convención de estatus que hubiese sido ¿verdad? Eh, la manera ideal para poder resolver este asunto. Eh, entiendo que hay muchas maneras de mirar el borrador de este proyecto de ley 
y eh, mejorar la, eh, el proyecto de ley y la manera en la cual se está llevando el diálogo, particularmente para involucrar y escuchar a los boricuas más impactados por la tenacidad de la colonia. Los problemas que desde nuestra organización y nuestros aliados locales hemos identificado en este borrador de proyecto de ley incluyen la falta de detalles y claridad en ciertas opciones de estatus, un lenguaje que intente inclinar a los puertorriqueños hacia una opción de estatus particular, que es la anexión, y que el Congreso quiera dictar, por ejemplo, qué tipo de república establecería Puerto Rico bajo la independencia. También hay problemas con la definición de la ciudadanía estadounidense, ¿verdad? como se ha mencionado, bajo el estatus de libre asociación, y varias cosas que el borrador no menciona, como qué pasará con la deuda de Puerto Rico, eh, ¿verdad? como mencionó el compañero Emanuel, y bajo las diferentes opciones de estatus, qué pasará, eh, por ejemplo, con el idioma que controla nuestras leyes, nuestras escuelas, nuestros tribunales, ¿Eh? los impuestos federales, como han comentado varios eh, compañeros, ¿verdad? Y además de eso, eh, no se menciona la participación de la diáspora puertorriqueña en esta votación. Somos muchos, como habló la compañera, que nos hemos tenido que ir de Puerto Rico, pero seguimos, ¿verdad?, eh, lo que está pasando políticamente aquí. Tampoco se menciona la aplicabilidad de la ley Jones o la falta de ella en las diferentes opciones de estatus. La ley Jones encarece un montón de productos en Puerto Rico y eh, ¿verdad? Eh, realmente impide el crecimiento económico, como se ha mencionado. Finalmente, quiero reiterar ¿verdad? Eh, nuestro deseo de que se lleven vistas del Congreso en Puerto Rico, en español y en Washington, D.C., de manera bilingüe para tener un récord oficial de las diversas opiniones del pueblo puertorriqueño acerca de este proyecto. Como persona joven, también quiero reiterar que la juventud en Puerto Rico ya no confía en los partidos políticos tradicionales. No sé si vieron ayer, pero el gobernador de Puerto Rico fue abuchado en la universidad, ¿verdad? Eh, y cualquier proceso que se lleve en Puerto Rico debe tener un elemento de alcance neutral eh, y financiado por el gobierno de Estados Unidos que llegue a los jóvenes y que también fiscalice el rol de los partidos coloniales, eh, sea el PNP o el PPD, en este proceso, ya que muchos hemos visto como los partidos tradicionales han utilizado referéndums pasados para favorecer su opción de estatus y mover sus agendas partidistas. Gracias. Muchas gracias nuevamente por su tiempo y quedo atento. Gracias. Uh, a mis colegas, si hay alguna pregunta. Un Una pregunta para uh, Karina Claudio Bentancourt. Um, hablaste sobre um, el perspectivo de jóvenes sobre los partidos políticos aquí en la isla y quería saber um, si hay mecanismos alternativas en que el Congreso también puede recibir otros perspectivos encima de que los, los, que los uh, partidos que tenemos of, ya ofrecen. Sí. Bueno. ¿No? Hola. Por favor. Sí. Eh, pues de, yo creo que hablar eh, ¿verdad? con la sociedad civil es bien importante, con grupos que no están afi afiliados a, a los partidos políticos, eh, con personas que ¿verdad? viven al margen en, en este archipiélago, eh, y mm, con mucho gusto, pues desde nuestra organización podríamos ayudar a, a agenciar algunas de esas conversaciones que estén fuera de la política partidista tradicional puertorriqueña. Gracias. 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 ¿Alguien más? Thank you very much. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Let me invite the next panel up. Bien, 
Yo sé que, yo entiendo que hay discusión entre uh, el público que está aquí. Si les quiero pedir que por favor las conversaciones uh, bajarlas o si es una conversación lenta o y, afuera y porque los da, los da, podemos escuchar nosotros que estamos aquí exactamente la plática que está ocurriendo ahí y, y, está, y no podemos escuchar los panelistas como debíamos, si me hacen el favor. Thank you. La mina está invitada a sus comentarios. No. Es tiempo para su comentario, la opinión que va a dar. Absolutely, it's your turn. Okay, well, good afternoon, distinguished honorable members of the panel. Um, Mr. Robles, uh, Ms. Varela, and Mr. Brian Modesti. Welcome to Puerto Rico. This is the Pearl of the Caribbean. My name is Yvette Chardon. I'm a Puerto Rican baby boomer from Ponce, Puerto Rico who feels honored. Yeah, we can all hear you. I'm sorry. You need to talk okay. into the mic for the I'm record. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, my name is Yvette Chardon. I'm a Puerto Rican baby boomer from Ponce, Puerto Rico, who feels honored by this unique opportunity to express my feelings and beliefs about my island's situation. I thank all of you for your effort and dedication to reach consensus and design this compromise draft. I am a very proud U.S. citizen like most of my fellow Puerto Ricans on the island, yet I cannot feel proud of the fact that my nation maintains 3.2 million <coughs> disenfranchised, second-class U.S. citizens living under colonialism in the 21st century. Being a baby boomer, I have lived the history of this colonial status and have seen how the economic and social development model of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico has not worked. It has failed. It has kept us stagnant and poor. It has driven us into bankruptcy. My Puerto Rico has become the tax haven tropical paradise for others. Thank you, Representative Velasquez. You could not have described it any better when you said, and I quote, the current status is unsustainable, unjust, and undignified. You made my day, Nida Margarita. I know you must have looked deep into your heart, into your Puerto Rican heart, and as Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, our com resident commissioner, said, I respect you more. Um, Doing some little research, I learned that Puerto, Rico, uh, that Puerto Ricans have loyally, bravely sacrificed. They have shed sweat, blood, and tears to defend our, oh my God, I'm nervous. <laughs> our noble flag ever since the Revolutionary War and even during the Civil War. <sighs> As I speak here today, 35,000 Puerto Ricans are on active duty, and 330,000 veterans have bravely and proudly served in every single military conflict since World War I. But the military is not the only place where Puerto Ricans have excelled themselves. There they receive the Congressional Gold Medal and multiple medals of honor. But Puerto Ricans, we have also excelled in science, the arts, music, Grammys, Oscars, NASA, even a judge in the Supreme Court and a Surgeon General. These last two Puerto Rican women. Can you imagine how much more we, con we, could con we would contribute if we were to enjoy full equality and democracy like our fellow citizens do in the States? Puerto Rico is the southernmost border to this nation. We are the bridge to South and Latin America. As a state, we would not be a burden to our union, to the union, I'm sorry. Au contraire, <laughs> we would add another flag, to our, to another star to our noble flag. 
assuming all the responsibilities and rights. It implies to be a state of the greatest, most democratic nation on earth. As a woman, wife, mother, and grandmother, I respectfully ask of you today to allow us to reach our dream, the American dream, without the need to split our families and without feeling forced to move stateside to search for equality, voting rights, better opportunities, and a better quality of life. Our families are the nuclei of our society. And this colonial territory is tearing them apart, and this has to stop. I respectfully ask of you today, please be on the right side of history and make it part of your legacy in Congress to give us Puerto Ricans the opportunity to democratically express ourselves in the ballot box and define our political future. Thank you. You have the power to stop 124 years of okay. colonization, discrimination. Thank you. We need to go on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Please. Well, thank you. Thank you. Comienzo. Yeah, por favor. Estimado Presidente Grijalva y estimado todos los miembros del comité. Mi nombre es Ilma Rodríguez, Presidenta de Puerto Rico Cogió Estadidad. Queremos expresar nuestra más sincera gratitud por el tiempo que dedican todos ustedes para ayudar a los ciudadanos americanos que vivimos en esta isla a resolver la situación colonial que define nuestro destino desde el año 1898, hace ya mucho tiempo. La condición de deterioro, decadencia económica y social en la que se encuentra nuestra isla demuestra que la forma utilizada no funciona, ya que no tiene las herramientas económicas necesarias para crecer al mismo nivel que un Estado. Es hora de decidir, es tiempo de resolver este dilema. Como ustedes saben, Puerto Rico está sujeto a los poderes plenarios del Congreso en virtud de la cláusula territorial. Somos un territorio, sí, somos un territorio de la nación más poderosa del mundo. No. Somos un territorio de la nación que simboliza la igualdad y defiende las libertades de todos los seres humanos en todos los rincones del planeta. Somos un territorio de una gran nación, una nación de oportunidades para quien se quiere superar, una nación de igual protección de las leyes, una nación donde se puede despertar con la esperanza de que el esfuerzo de nuestro trabajo proveerá un mejor futuro para nosotros y para nuestros hijos, y para mis nietos y bisnietos. Queremos ser parte de la nación americana, pero esa gran nación nos ha olvidado nos ha mantenido en una condición de desventaja social. Somos ciudadanos americanos y queremos esa ciudadanía plena con todos sus derechos y sus responsabilidades. No se trata de las ayudas que se recibirán cuando Puerto Rico se convierte en un Estado. Tampoco se trata de la seguridad que tendremos en nuestras fronteras, ni de cómo mejorará el gobierno, ni de la estabilidad que nos traerá la estadidad. Se trata de darnos la oportunidad de ser plenamente quienes en realidad somos, puertorriqueños, ciudadanos americanos, parte de esa gran nación. Se seca la boca. No estamos en igualdad de condiciones que nuestros conciudadanos en los estados. Solo hay que dar un paseo por esta hermosa isla para darse cuenta que esta desigualdad ha tenido un impacto significativo en nuestra calidad de vida, en nuestra infraestructura, en nuestro desarrollo económico, en nuestra salud, en nuestra educación, en nuestra seguridad. Nuestra gran nación americana se ha olvidado que debe darnos la oportunidad de escoger qué camino queremos seguir. Sin más excusas, soñamos con el camino hacia la igualdad y el progreso. Ese es el futuro esperanzador que todos queremos con todos los deberes y responsabilidades que esto conlleva para finalmente obtener el respeto y justicia social que nos merecemos. Por eso, muchos puertorriqueños han optado por reubicarse en algunos de los 50 estados. Al momento, es la única forma de disfrutar de una ciudadanía plena y de tener las oportunidades que tienen el resto de nuestros conciudadanos, nuestros hermanos y hermanas del norte. La isla 
es la colonia más antigua del mundo, pero nuestros soldados, que también son soldados americanos, han estado luchando y muriendo con valentía y orgullo para defender los principios de libertad e igualdad desde la Primera Guerra Mundial. Es inconcebible que la nación líder de la democracia en el mundo, que ha sido una inspiración hasta ahora, se haya negado a apoyarla clara y enérgicamente la misma regla para sus ciudadanos en Puerto Rico. La lucha por la estabilidad es una lucha de los derechos civiles y este tema trasciende la política partidista. No es una causa liberal o conservadora, es una sola causa y esta causa es de igualdad. Después de 124 años de desigualdad que se ha manifestado continuamente, entendemos que ya es hora de que tengamos los mismos derechos y responsabilidades que, que nuestros conciudadanos estadounidenses. En 2017, en 2012, 2017 y 2020 se demostró que una mayoría prefiere la estadidad entre posibles alternativas. Ha quedado demostrado con pasados eventos electorales Igual. que los puertorriqueños quieren acabar Igual. con el actual estatus territorial de la isla. Quiere aprovechar al máximo esta oportunidad que tenemos para mejorar nuestra calidad de vida, aprovechando las herramientas que nos ofrece la Unión Permanente. Queremos evolucionar al mismo ritmo que nuestros ciudadanos en los estados y salir hacia adelante. Yo soy ejemplo de ese deseo que tenemos los puertorriqueños de progresar. Denos la oportunidad de decidir. En el referéndum de noviembre del 2020 se nos preguntó, ¿debería Puerto Rico ser admitido inmediatamente en la Unión de Estados? Sí o no. Esto nos proporcionó al votante la opción de votar a favor o en contra de convertirnos en un estado de los Estados Unidos durante una elección sin precedente en que la, los candidatos de la isla ganaron por estrechos márgenes. Los resultados del sí alcanzado el 53% de los votos es un mandato claro sin dejar lugar a excusas o interpretaciones. Debemos seguir hacia adelante para poner fin al estancamiento político, para poder tener igualdad y pedir que el Congreso termine décadas de trato injusto y le dé a Puerto Gracias. Rico del siglo XXI el respeto. Voy a terminar diciendo que apoyo esta legislación de consenso que permita escoger entre alternativas descolonizadoras no territoriales aceptadas constitucionalmente para terminar definitivamente con tu con Gracias. El estatus colonial. Gracias por el comentario. Por favor, caballero. Chairman Grijalva and distinguished members of the Natural Resources Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to express our position regarding the Puerto Rico Status Act. My name is Francisco González Magas. I appear on behalf of the League of United Latin American Citizens, Puerto Rico chapter. LULAC is dedicated to protecting and promoting the civil rights of Hispanics in the United States. On April 30, 2022, LILAC Puerto Rico approved a resolution expressing its opposition to Puerto Rico's political status under the Territory Clause. Also, LULAC's National Assembly has on multiple occasions approved resolutions advocating for admission of Puerto Rico as the 51st state of the nation reflecting the will of the people of Puerto Rico as expressed in 2012, 2017, and 2020. Our status as a territory hinders any significant efforts at economic growth. We have no voting representation in Congress, and although Puerto Ricans proudly serve in the American Armed Forces, we cannot vote for our Commander-in-Chief. Between 2010 and 2020, the population of Puerto Rico fell by 11.8%. This is only a small sampling of the impact colonialism is having on Puerto Rico. Furthermore, colonialism is contrary to what the framers of the Constitution had in mind. The Constitution of the United States does not contain any provisions for the administration of colonies. Rather, it has Section 3 of Article 4, also known as the Territory Clause. It is revealing that this is the same section of the Constitution where the process for admission as a state of the Union is established. Territories were not meant to be retained indefinitely. They were meant to become a state. In 1898, Puerto Rico and other territories raised the Star-Spangled Banner for the first time. Legal questions and controversies regarding how these territories would be governed quickly arose and ultimately reached the United States Supreme Court. Although there are a number of what came to be known as the insular cases, particular attention should be paid to Downs v. Bidwell where a distinction between incorporated and unincorporated territories was first made, and Balzac v. Puerto Rico, which held that Puerto Rico was not an incorporated territory, and Congress could therefore decide which parts of the Constitution would apply. It is because of this judicial distinction that Puerto Rico's current colonial status has been, has been upheld and has endured for 124 years. In 1952, by virtue of Public Law 600, 
the Constitution of the Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico, or the Commonwealth, was ratified. This created the illusion of autonomy and a false narrative that a bilateral agreement existed between the United States and Puerto Rico. However, this carefully created fiction of the Commonwealth as anything other than a colony began to unravel. In, 20, in, 20, in 2005, the President's Task Force on Puerto Rico status issued a report re reiterating that Congress retains the constitutional authority to revise and even revoke the powers of self-government currently exercised by the government of Puerto Rico. In 2012, local referendum, the first question asked citizens whether they wished into, uh, Puerto Rico to remain subject to the territory clause. A clear majority of almost 54% voted no. In 2016, by virtue of the territory clause, Congress passed PROMESA. Now, one can argue the merits and flaws of PROMESA. However, its authority over any local law, including Puerto Rico's constitution, is unquestionable. PROMESA is therefore the practical manifestation of Congress's plenary powers over Puerto Rico. Also in 2016, the Supreme Court issued its opinion in Puerto Rico v. Sanchez Valle. The court reasoned that federal sovereignty was granted by the states, whereas Puerto Rico's sovereignty was granted by the federal government and concluded that Puerto Rico's self-government was subordinate to the federal government in general and to Congress specifically. This holding was reiterated as recently as two months ago in United States v. Vallejo Madero. In the last two decades, all three branches of the federal government have declared that we are a colony. However, although we cite Vallejo Madero as an example of this, we must, we must also note that it revealed the precarious footing that the insular cases currently have. Both Justice Gersuch and Justice Mayor, Sotomayor criticized the insular cases heavily. Justice Gersuch went as far as stating that he hoped one day soon they could be overturned. Two conclusions can be drawn from this. The first is that Puerto Rico's current political status is colonial in nature, definition, and effect. The second is that Puerto Rico's colonial status is unsustainable. Final resolution of Puerto Rico's status is proper and necessary, and it cannot happen under the current Estado Libre Asociado. The Estado Libre Asociado is the problem. It cannot also be the solution. Resolution of Puerto Rico's status is beneficial to the United States as well. The advantages of a prosperous Puerto Rico serving as a bridge between the United States and the Caribbean and South America are evident, and an answer to the question of Puerto Rican status will serve to reassert America's place in the world as an example of democracy. The Puerto Rico Status Bill is a democratic and viable mechanism for the final resolution of Puerto Rico's political status, but it can, it can only be so as long as it calls for a direct vote, the options given are non-territorial, and the result is binding. Given that these elements are present in the consensus bill being discussed, Thank we you. believe it to be an historic milestone. Thank you. And pursuant to our resolution, we endorse and support it. And lastly, we thank, thank, thank you. you again for the opportunity. Sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and other distinguished members of the congressional delegation. <clears throat> I recognize the efforts of Congressman Gonzalez Colon and Governor Pierre Luisi, and I thank each one of you for working together in finding common ground to create a draft discussion bill on the status of Puerto Rico. I thank you as well for visiting our island to hear firsthand from the people, as well as local committees of the national parties. My name is Delegate Lefranc Fortuño. I'm a shadow representative elected by the people of Puerto Rico to U.S. Congress to fight for full equality and democracy for the U.S. citizens living in Puerto Rico. But today I stand before you among many Puerto Ricans who, like me, are concerned about the dark path that Puerto Rico has been subject to for the last couple years. <clears throat> Like if it wasn't enough that Congress imposed an undemocratic unilateral fiscal control board on the island, our people have been subject to discrimination on numerous federal programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and most recently SSI. Nevertheless, it makes no sense for the U.S. to hold 3.2 million Am American citizens hostage of democracy. We've been U.S. nationals and citizens for over 120 years and it's about time we are treated as such. Therefore, this committee must stay firm and deny any remote possibility of including the current colonial territorial condition as an option going forward. After all, we can't decolonize Puerto Rico by including a non-democratic colonial option. 
Statehood is the only option that will give the people a right to say on their president, two U.S. senators and members of Congress with full voting rights, same funding and inclusion on the rest of the, as the rest of the states and first class U.S. citizenship for generations to come. Our veterans will be able to have a say on who their commander in chief is. This is simple and the people of Puerto Rico know it. The, that's why on the last three locally legislated plebiscites, the majority has rejected the current colonial condition and has voted for statehood overwhelmingly. Independence and sovereignty in free association with the United States of America are two modalities of independence. This has been recognized by the DOJ in numerous occasions, but they are both decolonizing and democratic options for the people of Puerto Rico to choose from. And even though, when asked, I'm sure that we will vote in favor of statehood overwhelmingly once again, this committee needs to revise the language of citizenship included in Section 208 of this draft bill. Congress should not impose U.S. citizenship on residents and of an independent, separate, sovereign nation. The procedure should be uniform to any other immigration request done by, by a son of two American citizens. After all, if you're a U.S. citizen living outside of the U.S., you're obligated to pay for all taxes. In the, is this the intention of the committee? What about the citizenship of the nation of Puerto Rico? Is Congress considering a dual citizenship for the residents of Puerto Rico under this compact? These questions remain to be unanswered. If we want to make sure that Puerto Rico has full sovereignty and has the tools to prosper economically and stop young professionals from leaving this island every single day and moving stateside, looking for better opportunities for them, their families, let's work together to perfect this bill so Congress can act now and convert it into U.S. law and leave behind in history the oldest colony in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sir. Hi. Hello. Hi, and good afternoon to all. I am Angel Cintron Jimenez, finding myself grateful for the privilege of addressing the esteemed committee today in a dual capacity, both as the CFO of the Young Democrats of Puerto Rico and as a concerned father seeking equal rights under the Constitution. First, as a board member of the Young Dems, I have defended many liberal causes, with one of the most critical being equal rights for all U.S. citizens. This includes defending the democratic will of the majority of Puerto Ricans for admission to the Union as an equal and sovereign state. Now, as father to 10-month-old Angelito, who along with his mom make up my whole world, I have to act. With both Louisiana and Puerto Rican roots, Angelito could be considered an authentic Cajun Rican, born here in San Juan, living proof that the American and Puerto Rican melting pots are not only a theory, but a tangent reality for many. I cannot begin to tell you the complications that his mother and I have had to endure from healthcare and banking as far as retirement and family planning, all made burdensome under the weight of colonialism. The knowledge that we are suffering from a lack of sovereignty which hinges on the sole fact that we live on this island, my home, spurs me to action in the hopes of achieving equality through self-determination. In that spirit of progress, I propose we call this draft bill the Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act, since it is a real and binding process to ensure the supreme definition that is a final solution to colonialism and the lack of sovereignty that ails us. I also humbly propose that Title II be amended to read independence in free association with the United States. In the name of honesty and transparency, either Title II is amended to read independence in free association, or Title I is amended to read sovereignty without free association. In the alternative, and just to drive the argument home, both could be renamed. Title I could be independent republic, and Title II could be associated republic. All that matters is that they are named the same at their core, since they are, in essence, the same. In that spirit, everywhere in the PRSDA, and most importantly in the plebiscite, it must be made clear that free association is independence, and naming it something else is incorrect and misleading. In truth, I believe the option should be reworded to a choice between independent sovereignty, independence, associated sovereignty, or free association, and federated sovereignty, statehood. 
to clearly distinguish between the options, but any synonym will suffice so long as it is expressed identically in all variations of the same essential option. Yesterday afternoon, the proponents of independence expressed to this committee that as long as the draft bill was self-executing with respect to statehood, they would not support it. Although they did not express the same concern of the self-executing nature of independence or free association, I think that speaks for itself. In fact, I will go just a bit further to argue that the Independence Party is actually seeking sovereignty with free association. According to their party platform, which under status outlines some of the crucial concessions that Title II of the PRSDA contemplates, like foreign affairs, trade, finance, taxation, security, and defense, dispute resolution, immigration, economic benefits, grants, and determination of the free association. The first item on the status portion of the Independence Party's platform is to maintain friendly ties with the U.S. And it does not get friendlier between two sovereigns than free association. It is known that very few seek the total independence contemplated in Title I, largely due to citizenship. And the main objective of the Independence Party's status transition strategy, as outlined in their own party platform, are largely those contemplated until Title, title II's free association. The implications of SCOTUS's historical, but not surprising, Sanchez Valle case, which made clear that this territory and every territory lacks the sovereignty that a republic or federated state possesses, leaves no room for interpretation other than the current colonial status is unyielding, leaving only two real options, independent sovereignty with or without free association and federated sovereignty or statehood. The outbursts of disapproval from the status quo PBD party to the honest consensus contained in the PRSDA with respect to its decolonizing effect should speak for themselves, since it correctly rejects the current territorial and colonial status quo. This historic compromise, the newly minted PRSDA, makes me proud to believe in the democratic process and proud of these United States of America, for I truly believe that the addition of Puerto Rico will only strengthen the union with diversity, culture, and fresh blood in Congress. Thank you all for the time and effort invested Thank in you. solving the sovereign status of the world's oldest colony and my family's home of Puerto Rico. Thank you very much. Sir? My name is Luis Herrero Acevedo. I am a lawyer, political consultant, and commentator. I would like to start by commending the draft proposed bill and the process led by Majority Leader Hoyer and Chairman Grijalva. Getting proponents of statehood and sovereignty to discard old tropes and bring forth new ideas and processes to resolve Puerto Rico's centenary political conundrum is no small feat. Gracias, Nidia. Gracias, Jennifer, por sentarse y hablar. In theory, this is how the democratic process should work. Thank you once again for getting it done. If approved by Congress, this draft bill will send a clear signal of what a Democratic majority in the House of Representatives is willing to offer Puerto Ricans. The draft is a starting point for future discussions and a solution to the status issue. But as we all learned in elementary school, a bill does not become a law until approved by the Senate and signed by the President. And therein lies the problem. As a political consultant, I understand very well how political talk on the record, especially on the congressional record, vis-a-vis -vis how they talk behind closed doors. Everyone on this dais and every politician who has served in the Natural Resources Committee since the United States took Puerto Rico by military force has had multiple off-the-record conversations about Puerto Rico. And everyone on this dice must agree, of the record, of course, there are no votes in the Senate to make Puerto Rico a state. Not today, not yesterday, not tomorrow. Since 1898, Puerto Rican statehood has been a mirage, lip service to score cheap political points or raise a few dollars for a campaign. I compare it to a mythical animal, much talk about but never seen, a unicorn. Through all its stages as a U.S. colonial territory, there has never been 51, much less the 60 votes needed in the Senate to make Puerto Rico a state. Puerto Rico has been many things to the United States, an able base and shooting range, a profitable sugar plantation, a tax haven, a biolab, a Cold War theater used to foster revolutions and counter-revolutions in the Caribbean, a winter vacation spot, an Estado Libre Asociado, and much more, but it has never been, nor it will ever be a state. And that is the truth of the record. 
So let me be the first to say it on the record. Puerto Rico statehood is impossible in the Senate. It's a unicorn. Why will Puerto Rico will never be a state when 37 other territories were able to join the union? The reasons are many and my time is short. But my preferred theory is that although Puerto Rico is owned by the United States, it has never been successfully Americanized. All histories on how territories become state have the same protagonist, a white American man. It's no coincidence that the last names of the fathers of Texas statehood were Austin and Houston and not Gonzalez or Hidalgo. The last names of the fathers of Alaskan statehood were Gruning and Barlett, not Kaitak or Kiluki. In its 172 years as a state, California has never had an elected governor with a Spanish surname. I wonder why. No congressperson will say this on the record, especially those with a couple thousand Puerto Ricans voters in their district, but you know it to be true. Even with a democratic majority, there is no filibuster-proof coalition to make Puerto Rico a state in the Senate. No importa cuando lo leas. Even this draft bill confirms the unicorn theory. To this state, except for a Republican resident commissioner Gonzalez, not a single Republican in the House or Senate has endorsed the draft. Senators Marco Rubio and Rick Scott, who represent over a million Puerto Ricans from Florida, do not even bring the subject up. The mere possibility of adding Puerto Rico as a state dooms this or any other draft in the Senate. If, the po if politics is the art of the possible, then Puerto Rico statehood's politics is the art of the impossible. To end this Gordian knot, Congress must design a process that can garner the 60 votes needed in the Senate. We need to bring Republicans to the table and hammer out a deal. Puerto Ricans politicians have used status as a political tool for decades, a cure for all our diseases, a handy excuse to justify their many terrible local governments. Millions of Puerto Ricans truly believe statehood is possible because five generations of pro-statehood politicians have promised that la estadidad está a la vuelta de la esquina. Only Congress and this committee can tell Puerto Ricans the truth. Puerto Rican statehood is not in the cards. The same way that after many years you are now saying, for the record, that Estado Libre Asociado was original conceived is not viable, you should be as straightforward with statehood. The wording can be simple and succinct. Puerto Rico, it's not you, it's me. Let's stay friends. Sign U.S. Congress. Puerto Rican politics are changing. A new generation is ready to partner with Congress and design a process that can bring Democrats and Republicans together and make Puerto Rico a prosperous, democratic, and independent nation. But first, you must speak the truth to us on the record. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, let me begin there, if I may, Mr. Herrero. Question, and, and your analysis of the Senate, uh, and why that is vital is the, that's true, absolutely. But let's just talk about the role that we have, Resources Committee and the House of Representatives. Shouldn't we do our job too? Yeah, of course. Okay. And, and shouldn't we produce a product that has some level of consensus? Of course. And if we do that, then the responsibility for people doing their job shifts, can you? Of course. Okay. Just want to make that clear. We're here to do our job. Whatever the Senate does, they need to do their job. And that's why I commend this yes. process, because you are doing something good. Any uh, questions? Can I, any questions? Yes, if I'm allowed. Please. Oh, it's uh, Francisco, yes. right? No, Luis. Ru pardon? Luis, Luis. Luis, Luis, pardon. Um, I will say on the record, <laughs> The points that you make about the Senate are, are completely legitimate. Um, and seríamos un colonia por más de 100 años por un razón, porque este sí es difícil, right? It's, it's not easy. Um, and I, I think your points are absolutely well taken. I think what we are in now, como una Puerto Rican del Bronx, aquí Puerto Rican aquí de la isla, we have to. We, we are in the messy process of trying to exercise some form of self-governance. It is imperfect, we'll get to dead ends, there'll, there'll be disagreements. I think what we need to figure out for ourselves, at least, is what does a legitimate process for us look like? And if we can figure out a process that has legitimacy, 
that at least we can agree on first, regardless of ideology. We need to figure that out because the negotiation shouldn't be in Congress. It should not be up to the imperial power to impose a process on us. But as uh, a valid option, which it is, there are 50 states. We understand that legally, politically, limitedly, there's statehood exists, but there's no right to statehood. There's no intention of the United States to give us statehood. What that does by putting statehood here in the process is guaranteeing we're going to be a colony for 122 more years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the issue, because it, how do we get this bill to the president? How do we make it a law? I, I love this bill. I'm in favor of it. I've been in favor of it since the first time I saw the draft. I understand how the process was made. I've read every single article. I've talked to, who, to any people that has, uh, has been available and know how the process was made. I know it was hard. Mm -hmm. But how yeah. do we get it to the White House? And, you know, I, I, and I, I think, Chairman, it's... It, I don't know what impact this has on the legislative text itself, but I just think it's important to underscore the point that's being made here in that we have an imperial power that has de facto you do. jurisdiction you, yeah, over the, a the, colony. The, 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 I mean, we are, we are in no the question. National Resources Committee. We're not in the Puerto Rico Committee. UN. Uh, or in the <laughs> foreign relations. No, no, and, and, and you're absolutely right. The center, the center premises of of this legislation and the difficulty in getting to where we are right now is around two points that there is agreement yeah. on this table. Mm -hmm. That is decolonization. Correct. And the other one is the agreement to use that imperial authority for a binding, uh, yeah. uh, a binding uh, authority for the vote that the people in Puerto Rico take. That Congress is bound to use that authority mm -hmm. to, to make sure that that happens. And I want to I wanna make a, a very important point. Since we are a colony owned, wholly owned by the United States, mm -hmm. Puerto Ricans, we cannot go to the UN. We cannot go to the Organization of American States. Okay. We can only come here to the Natural Resources Committee. You are our sovereign. You literally are the sovereign of our, of our people. So here we are redressing our grievances and trying to Please, I, I commend the process and the progress that is being made with this bill, but the real alternative has to be to create something that can be made into a law and that can change Puerto Rico's status. And if, with if that, allowed, let me... If, do I'm you sorry, am I, can I comment, make a comment about the discussion that was going on right now about his argument? Uh, uh, of course. I mean, uh, I've lost pretty much control of it anyway, so go ahead. <laughs> sorry. It's just that... I'm in favor of statehood, and I've been home my whole life, and I've heard this argument many, many times before. Uh, statehood is a non-issue, it's a non-starter, there is no environment for it in Washington, uh, there's no environment for it in the House, and there's no environment for it in the Senate. It's an age-old argument against statehood that's been made by pretty much everybody who is against statehood in Puerto Rico. But the problem is, we have an opportunity here now and he cannot. Who does? Who does? Convention staff. I'm trying to. There's a heart on I got it. Por favor. Ivan? Ivan? Vamos a. We take a, how long? Five uh, minutes? Ten. Five, ten. Ten, mi we'll, we'll, ten minute uh, recess. Uh, thank you very much. And then we'll start with the next panel.
Gracias por, la, por su paciencia. Uh, vamos a comenzar de nuevo. Si me haces el favor. Zeran. To all the members of the Natural Resources Committee, good afternoon and welcome to Puerto Rico. My name is Alba Iris Calderón Cestero, and I am a professional woman born and raised in Puerto Rico, a mother of three, and I am here to make my comments for this draft for Title III statehood. I want to thank all of you for addressing this important issue and provide us with an alternative in consensus to finally end the colony, the status that prevents our island to develop on, in every way possible. Now I present my comments for this draft. On page four, line 22, it reads, majority vote required. Approval of a status option must be by a majority of the valid votes cast. I believe that the word majority needs to be defined clearly. For example, if one option receives 1,000 votes and other option receives 998 votes, Will the 1,000 votes be considered a majority? On page 5, line 1 through 6, section 4, it reads, runoff plebiscite. If there is not a majority in favor of one of the three options defined in this act, then a runoff plebiscite shall be held on March 3rd, 2024, which shall offer eligible voters a choice of the two options that receive the most of votes in the plebiscite held under paragraph one. The word majority has to be defined clearly. What constitute a majority for this plebiscite? As the paragraph was written, the only way that a runoff plebiscite has to be held is if there is a tie, Otherwise, one of the choices will, be, will have the majority of the votes. On page 10, line 9, it reads, Jurisdiction of District Court. The United States District Court for the District of Puerto Rico shall have original and exclusive jurisdiction of any civil action alleging a dispute or controversy pertaining to electoral processes conducted under this section. There is a need to specify the extension of the court's jurisdiction, define what is an electoral process, and to what extension is considered an electoral process. If a delay in submitting a certification, for example, is considered an issue to submit to the court and still be a part of the electoral process. Page 12, line 13 reads, after the last word, general, there is a need to add this wording and make the changes and or corrections given by the general, if any. Page 42, line 22, subsection 4 reads, Incorporation. Puerto Rico shall remain un unincorporated until its admission as a state of the union under paragraph 3. I believe that the best wording for the, the, this paragraph should be Puerto Rico shall remain with the same status that it has until its admission as a state of the union under paragraph three. Once again, I thank you for making this happen. Please make this draft become a bill. Convince your colleagues in the Senate to do the same. This is about equal rights, equal citizenship, and equal responsibilities. Puerto Rico has been a territory for too long. We are U.S. citizens, and we treasure our nation, our flag, our pledge. Before I finish, let me ask you to just think for a moment. If you had to stay in Puerto Rico for a period of time, are you aware that you lose a lot of rights that you have had for all your life? Are you willing to give them up? It doesn't matter if you just answer no in your head. Just by being here, you already lost them. Statehood for Puerto Rico, it is our best option. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, the specificity of your comments to the sections. Thank you. Sir? My name is Salvador Vargas Ruiz. As a Puerto Rican American, statehood is genocide. La estadidad es el genocidio. The Puerto Rican Status Act deprives 5 million 
you, um, Puerto Ricans living in the United States to cast their vote. The National Resource Committee is racist. Let's move on. The United States Congress doesn't need a Puerto Rican Status Act to emancipate the Puerto Rican people on the so-called decolonization bill. The United States of America withdrew from the Philippine Islands and Cuba in the 1930s and 1940s and emancipated the Philippine people and the Cuban people without enacting any plebiscite of any kind. Puerto Rico must be given the same treatment and be granted emancipation immediately. The eyes of the world and the United Nations will be focused on the so-called Puerto Rican Status Act bill. For those few Puerto Ricans who cry inside the PMP party that I am, that I am a United States citizen and I have rights, yes, you do have the rights to enter into any of the 50 states of the United States without refusal under the accord signed between the people of the United States of America and the people of Puerto Rico, titled Estado Libre Asociado, 1952, that has given Puerto Rico five Miss Universe and two gold medals in the World Olympics as a sovereign nation separate from the USA. The Puerto Rican PNP members have the right as U.S. citizens to live in the tent cities of California. You have a right to live under the bridges of Florida and even fish for your food. You have a U.S. citizen right to live in the drug-infected Philadelphia, Kingston, Chicago slums, New York slums, or you have the right as a U.S. citizen at PMP to live in New York City, the crime capital of the, of the United States of America. My dear U.S. Congress, I can't be any clear. The United States citizenship doesn't allow you, PNP, from Puerto Rico and the United States Congress to mandate an act of self-genocide under the biased, contaminated Puerto Rican Status Act draft by the National Resource Committee that still holds the Puerto Rican people as an object of the United States of America. The Puerto Rican Status Act states that 51% outcome in the results will constitute a win for that option. That will be rid ridiculous and very dangerous. Puerto Rico can erupt into a full-blown revolution. Has the United States of America forgotten the Puerto Rican attacks on Congress in 1950, much before January 6, 2020? Has the United States of America forgotten the Puerto Rican assassination attempt against United States President Truman? Or have we forgotten the seven F-16 United States jet fighters burned to the ground in San Juan Airport? Luis Munoz Marin? The United States citizenship of anyone doesn't give the right to genocide the Puerto Rican people. Furthermore, listen, only the Puerto Rican born and first generations can participate in all plebiscites. No other nationality found in Puerto Rico can cast a vote, meaning Dominicans, Cubans, Mexicans, Españoles, Venezolanos, Colombians, Americans are expelled from the Puerto Rican <clears throat> Status Act. Um, we must seek peace. Tenemos que buscar la paz between both our countries and not revolution. Thank you very much. Gracias. Sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished members of Congress, resident commissioner, honorable governor of Puerto Rico, Democratic Party, young Democrats of Puerto Rico, local parties, and my young colleagues, and US citizens of Puerto Rico. My name is Jose Rosselló. I am an active uh, member of the youth of the Progressive New Party and uh, the Young Democrats of Puerto Rico. And I rise to discuss the political status of Puerto Rico, which is home to 3.2 million U.S. citizens. As many of you may know, many attempts have been made in the past to proceed with federal legislation to try to move forward and resolve the island's territorial colonial status that has been imposed in our people for more than 500 years. 
first under Spain and now under the United States. However, it is the first time the Federal Congress has not only taken into consideration, but action to legitimately decolonize the island in a fair and binding process. The options provided are non-territorial and full self-governing for the people of Puerto Rico to finally obtain a just and democratic government. I am pleased to have an objection on Title II sovereignty and free association with the United States. In the past, locals in Puerto Rico were impregnated with the fact that we were actually a commonwealth, or in Spanish, el Estado Libre Asociado, and where a utopic fallacy status was believed to be witnessed before the Supreme Court of the United States had taken multiple, multiple decisions in the past 10 years, and where it was evident that the island of Puerto Rico was and has always been an incorporated territory since 1898, subject to the plenary powers of Congress, with no say, no vote, no, no consentment, and, the, and no decisions taken in Congress that benefit or affect Puerto Rico negatively. With that said, sovereignty and free association is a total complete opposition status than territorial colonial status, obviously. As the draft bill states in Title II and Title III, Puerto Rico is a sovereign, and I quote, Puerto Rico is a sovereign nation that has full authority and responsibility over its territory and population under a constitution of its own adoption that should be the supreme law of the nation. This clearly emphasizes that Puerto Rico would be totally separated from the United States as an independent republic, or if not an associated republic, or in Spanish, una república asociada with a pact under the titles of free association in the federal constitution, which establishes a termination and a due date that could be subject to a big risk and fully separating its ties with the United States. By that I mean that the US Postal Service may be at risk, federal courts, FBI, social federal benefits for low income, middle income citizens on the island and numerous other federal programs and entities. As stated in the language of the project under Title II, this would be up to the negotiation under the Pact of the Titles of Free Association with no pre-guarantee of whatsoever of all of them being implemented and secured in the island or even renovated, if so implemented under the, under the Articles of Free Association. With that said, I invite those local citizens in the island who unquestionably support the permanent union with the nation and having totally guarantee of securing the most sacred rights on the federal constitution, programs, medical benefits, and full parity towards our working class, our middle class, and low income families in our beloved island by voting for statehood. In addition, when it comes to the political destiny of a place, the views of the minority cannot trump or take precedence over the views of the majority. That would turn the concept of democracy over its head. Votes matter. This is why I say this, because statehood has won the past three local plebiscites held on the island, which clearly impacts the majority of the population in favor of Puerto Rico becoming the 51st state of the union. I reject the notion that statehood would weaken the culture of Puerto Rico or its proud tradition or affect the islands of the people of Puerto Rico. Summing up my presentation, I have no doubt that we will become, we will become the 51st state of the union. I will work tirelessly, tirelessly with the Young Democrats of Puerto Rico, with the president of our organization, Elisa Munoz, and other members, extended delegation of shadow elected congressional delegates, including Ricardo Rosselló and Roberto Lefranc-Fortuño, and others elected in May 16th, 2021, and the youth, progressive, the youth of the Progressive New Party to get this consensus moving forward and approved in both the House and the Senate for it to be delivered to the President Disc and finally have a binding federal consensus plebiscite held on the island as stated in the language of the project in November 5th of 2023. With all due respect, putting aside our preferences, ideologies, and opinions, I call for every Puerto Rican to vouch for this process of decolonization because if some don't, they simply, don't, they simply support the decades of colonial conundrum as said by our Congresswoman okay, Velasquez in the press conference once this draft Thank you very much. in May 16, Sir? 2022. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Edwin Francisco Rivera uh, Otero. I'm, I'm a young professional who came here to address my support of the Puerto Rico Status Act in, the, in this honorable committee. It's the first time that the U.S. Congress is considering a binding process to solve Puerto Rico's political status, which has been a colony for 
124 years that as the prison uh, time. It is important to note that on the island live around 3 million of U.S. citizens that do not have the same rights as a fellow citizens in the mainland. It's time that Congress makes an action to treat us equally. Why is more important solving the non-citizens issues than, than to solve the, the colonial issue of the American citizens living in Puerto Rico? Why? The importance of this binding process is the message that Congress is sending the U.S. wants to solve this important issue for the nation. It's important to mention that several fellow Puerto Ricans living in the mainland and some local politicians are denying us the right to be treated as equal and have the same rights as a fellow U.S. citizens. But those Puerto Ricans enjoy the benefits of statehood. Some fellow Puerto Ricans living in the mainland want to vote on this plebiscite. But the Puerto Rico Status Act states that a definition of eligible voters as a bona fide residents of Puerto Rico who are otherwise qualified to vote in the general elections in Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rican residents of the mainland don't comply with the definition expressed in the bill. Actual Puerto Rico's political status is discriminatory with the Supreme Court decisions such as Baello Madero and, and with Congress passing PROMESA, it is evident that the colonial situation is detrimental to Puerto Rico well-being. It is important to mention that as a colony, the sovereignty of Puerto Rico lives in U.S. Congress. Why can the congresistas que hacen campañas en español? Yo creo que el idioma no debe ser el, 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 la piedra en el camino para detener este proyecto en, en la... En el, en el, ni en la Cámara de Representantes Federal ni en el Senado. Hay congresistas, muchos de ellos, sus hijos estudiaron en colegios privados caros en Puerto Rico, que aprendieron inglés, fueron a las universidades americanas, estudiaron en los Estados Unidos en inglés y viven en Puerto Rico o viven en los estados de los más tranquilos y de, disfrutando de los beneficios de la estadía. Yo creo que eso es, eso es la, la forma más elitista de enseñarle a la gente de que no pueden progresar en la vida. Y eso no debe ser así. Y yo creo que eso hay que empezar a, a cambiarlo, porque Puerto Rico merece lo mejor. Gracias. Yeah. Please. Honorable Chairman and members of the Congress, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking your time for being here. For the record, my name is Keren Riquelme Cabrera. I'm senator at large for the government of Puerto Rico. And on behalf of my constituents, on my own behalf as an American citizen resident of Puerto Rico, I express deep gratitude for promoting the proposed draft of the Puerto Rico Status Act. Puerto Rican lives matter. Yet after 123 years of political history under the plenary powers of Congress, American citizens residing in Puerto Rico continue to be subjected to a discriminatory and unjustifiable unequal political relationship that denies us the full recognition of our constitutional rights. Our soldiers, many who are here today, have served, fought, and bled like any other American soldier in armed conflicts as members of the United States Armed Forces and have participated in more than 100 armed conflicts throughout history and remain serving actively today. Nevertheless, Puerto Rico remains the oldest existing colony in the Western Hemisphere and a territory of the United States. Subjected to the territorial incorporation doctrine established by the Insular Cases, a doctrine developed by Justice Edward White, who expressed concerns over the evils of admitting millions of inhabitants of unknown island people with an uncivilized race believed to be absolutely unfit for citizenship. And by Justice Henry Billings, who considered that America's territories were inhabited by alien races differing from us in religion, customs, and modes of thought. And by, by this, this very doctrine, which is still being used as a legal basis to perpetuate a treatment to American citizens living in Puerto Rico that includes denial of voting rights, 
denial of congressional representation, and denial of equality in federal programs. As American citizens, we have long paid our dues in the century past. I fully support the proposed draft for Puerto Rico Status Act in the name of democracy, in the name of justice and civil rights, but most of all, in the name of decency to do what is known to be right. During the last three plebiscites on the political status of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican electorate has consecutively expressed its unequivocal preference for statehood. During the last plebiscite, the 53% of the electorate issue a clear and mandate to the government of Puerto Rico to move legislation with the purpose of achieving statehood as a permanent political status for the future of Puerto Rico. Regarding the substantive text of the legislative measure, I wish to express my support for statehood, but I also say that I can say that I agree with the definition, just the definition of the other two status formula as proposed in the Puerto Rico Status Act draft. Even though there have been requests for the inclusion of the current Commonwealth formula in the bill. Under the current Commonwealth formula, Puerto Rico cannot be considered a state since it lacks sovereignty, that being one of the essential elements of the state. Under such status, Puerto Rico is under the plenary powers of the United States Congress so that the fundamental government decisions are made by the Congress. The Puerto Rican constitutions and laws are also conditioned by the North American legal system. Finally, I wish to express my opposition to the celebration of a runoff plebiscite as required under the Section 5A4 of the Puerto Rican Status Act draft. Under Section 5C, the Puerto Rican Status Act draft clearly states that the plebiscites authorized by this section shall be implemented by the Elections Commission consistent with the laws of Puerto Rico and federal law. The concept of a runoff election is completely foreign to Puerto Rico's electoral law, Law 58 2020, also known as the Puerto Rico Electoral Code of 2020, and it does not provide for a runoff election of any kind. Thank you for being here again, and for your benefit, I will be included as an attachment in the digital send to the committee a concrete resolution of Senate of Puerto Rico 36 in support of the present Puerto Rico Status Act draft. Thank you. Thank you very much. Caballero. Mi nombre es Antonio Faz Alzamora, pasado presidente del Senado de Puerto Rico a principios de este siglo. Saludo. Como legislador que fui por 40 años consecutivos, habiendo ocupado distintas posiciones de liderato, y como expresidente del Senado de Puerto Rico, entiéndase que mi comparecencia es en mi carácter personal y en representación de miles de puertorriqueños que desde hace más de 30 años venimos votando por un desarrollo, crecimiento, evolución y transformación de un Estado libre asociado no colonial y no territorial, según ha sido presentado por el Partido Popular en sus programas de gobierno en todas las elecciones generales. Comienzo señalando que este bojador de proyecto de ley excluye una cuarta opción basada en la resolución 2625 de la Asamblea General de la ONU de octubre de 1970, aún vigente y respaldada por Estados Unidos. En la misma, en el principio de la igualdad de derechos y de la libre determinación de los pueblos, establece una cuarta opción que menciona sobre la adquisición de cualquier otra condición política libremente decidida por un pueblo, constituye en forma del ejercicio del derecho de libre determinación de ese pueblo. Incluir esta cuarta opción me parece justa y adaptada a la realidad actual del derecho internacional. Debo entonces aprovechar esta oportunidad para informarle que cumpliendo con la cuarta opción de la antes mencionada resolución de la ONU, preparé un pacto de asociación entre los gobiernos del Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico y Estados Unidos de América. El mismo es de naturaleza no colonial y no territorial, sostenido y fundamentado en la soberanía del pueblo puertorriqueño, cumpliendo plenamente con el derecho internacional. Además, reconoce la capacidad de nuestro pueblo para pactar una asociación digna dentro del marco de la Constitución de los Estados Unidos, reafirmando nuestra singular identidad nacional caribeña y latinoamericana. El pacto de asociación que propongo da por terminada la relación indigna, territorial, colonial y proveerá las herramientas para poder sustituir 
una cultura de dependencia a una cultura de autosuficiencia y lograr un desarrollo económico pleno. Este pacto consta de un preámbulo y cuatro títulos. Se transfiere la soberanía de Puerto Rico, que está en manos del Congreso, a manos del pueblo puertorriqueño simultáneamente en el mismo documento y en el mismo acto que se establece el pacto bilateral. Puerto Rico se reserva unas jurisdicciones, le delega a Estados Unidos otra y comparte la gestante. Por consiguiente, en el mismo acto se deja de ser colonia y territorio sin tener que pasar por la separación o independencia. El Congreso tiene ante su consideración en formato legal y en forma detallada un instrumento específico e inclusivo sobre el cual puede sostenerse una relación digna y democrática basada en el respeto, cooperación e igualdad entre dos naciones distintas. Ninguna de las otras opciones de estatus tiene una propuesta detallada y en formato legal para presentarle al pueblo y al Congreso en estos momentos. El único yo, y la tienen ustedes ahí, se las, se las encargarán los staffers. Someto para récord copia del Pacto de Asociación versión 2020 para que forme parte del expediente legislativo de este bojador de medida congresional y lo pueden accesar en pactodeasociación.com, en inglés y en español. Respetuosamente solicito se enmiende el bojador y se incluya la cuarta opción mencionada de ELA no territorial y no colonial, como lo defino en su totalidad en el Pacto de Asociación como alternativa adicional y de esa forma el ELA puede estar presente con dignidad en la consulta a realizarse. De no incluirse la cuarta opción de Lela, no territorial, como lo defino en el pacto de asociación, entonces como segunda opción y solamente como segunda opción lo someto como la definición de la libre asociación incluida en el bojador del pacto. El pacto de asociación que presento es bilateral y solo puede ser alterado por mutuo acuerdo. En caso de que haya que renovarlo, el tiempo de duración no debe ser menos de 50 años con opción a renovarse nuevamente por el mismo tiempo y la ciudadanía debe, permane debe ser por sangre o nacimiento de padres puertorriqueños. Las definiciones de las distintas opciones en detalle deben estar en la papeleta o en un con un resumen preciso de las mismas, al igual que en las campañas, para evitar la demagogia. Para finalizar, quiero enfatizar en una realidad inequívoca que siendo Puerto Rico una nación caribeña latinoamericana de más de 400 años de existencia, con su propia identidad y cultura, la estadidad tiene el efecto de desaparecerla en otra nación distinta, eliminándonos del mapa internacional como nación para siempre. La misma tendría efectos negativos en la autoestima de los puertorriqueños al perder la presencia internacional en tantas áreas de la vida individual y colectiva como en los deportes, en las artes, en la cultura y en otras. Por lo tanto, el cambio a la estadidad debe ser por un mandato mayor y distinto a las demás opciones donde la nacionalidad puertorriqueña permanece. En protección a ese hecho, irrefutable e irreversible, a la estadidad debe exigírsele una supermayoría de votos, como ha sucedido con otros territorios en el pasado. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Señor. gracias. Uh, ¿Hay algunas preguntas? ¿Alguien tiene preguntas? Muchísimas gracias. Muy bien. Invitar al otro grupo, por favor. Gentlemen, you'll be heard for five minutes. Buenas tardes, señora presidenta pro tempore de la Comisión de Recursos Naturales de la Cámara de Representantes de los Estados Unidos y distinguidos y distinguidas integrantes de dicha comisión. Mi nombre es Alejandro Torres Rivera. Fui presidente del ilustre Colegio de Abogados y Abogadas de Puerto Rico para el bienio 2016-2018 y soy presidente de la Comisión para el Estudio del Desarrollo Constitucional de Puerto Rico de esta institución. Comparezco ante ustedes en representación de nuestra presidenta, la licenciada Daisy Calcaño López y nuestro colegio. Desde su asamblea el primero de septiembre de 1944, 
Hemos denunciado de manera categórica y clara la naturaleza colonial de la relación de Puerto Rico con Estados Unidos, demandando de su presidente y del Congreso la terminación de unas relaciones políticas injustas. Nuestro pueblo nunca ha ejercido su derecho de libre determinación. La sujeción política de Puerto Rico a los Estados Unidos es un problema que plantea la vigencia de los derechos humanos de nuestro pueblo. Conforme a la expresión de las Naciones Unidas en su resolución 1514, Romano 15 del 14 de diciembre de 1960, la sujeción de los pueblos a una subyugación y explotación extranjera constituye una negación de los derechos humanos fundamentales, algo que está ratificado en el Pacto Internacional de Derechos Humanos, Civiles y Políticos. Para el colegio, el mecanismo procesal idóneo para atender eh, nuestro reclamo de descolonización y el reconocimiento de nuestro derecho a ejercer la libre determinación, libre de interferencias ni obstáculos, y a su vez negociar con Estados Unidos una fórmula final de relaciones políticas entre ambos pueblos en la Asamblea Constitucional de Estatus. Pero esto que vemos que está con mayor afinidad determinado en el contenido del proyecto Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act del 2021, no nos impide expresarnos en torno al borrador de proyecto sobre la ley de estatus de Puerto Rico. Destacamos como elementos positivos en dicho borrador la creación de una comisión negociadora bilateral, la atención en cada una de las opciones de los aspectos relacionados con la ciudadanía, nacionalidad e inmigración, los poderes y prerrogativas del pueblo bajo cada una de las opciones, derechos económicos adquiridos por los habitantes de Puerto Rico, garantías personales de los ciudadanos, aspectos de gobierno propio, incluyendo los asuntos a considerar en la transición a las distintas opciones, el contenido de la libre asociación y la independencia como opciones descolonizadoras distintas y separadas, a ser aprobadas en una convención constitucional para los escenarios de independencia o libre asociación, tales como el debido proceso de ley, la igual protección de las leyes, libertad de palabra, prensa, reunión, asociación y religión, derechos de los acusados y otros derechos económicos, sociales y culturales, y la garantía de que ninguna persona nacida en la nación de Puerto Rico estará sin un Estado al momento de nacer. Existen otros aspectos importantes que se consideran en el proyecto y que una vez más señalamos, valoramos positivamente las expresiones allí contenidas, entre ellas aquellas que son tangentes a elementos de transmisión de ciudadanía, inmigración, libre tránsito y las garantías de mantenimiento de lo que son las transferencias federales de vengadas por los puertorriqueños y puertorriqueñas en el Seguro Social, veteranos, incapacidad, sobrevivientes y edad. Destacamos además que valoramos todas y cada uno de los señalamientos hechos como aspectos positivos del proyecto de borrador y señalamos que no serían inconsistentes con sustituir el mecanismo de dos plebiscitos por la convocatoria a una Asamblea Constitucional de Estatus para que sea una comisión negociadora de la Asamblea la que negocie con la contraparte federal el contenido de las opciones de estatus y sus transiciones. Consideramos de importancia mayor la precisión en los términos de un acuerdo de libre asociación en el cual se definan, entre otros aspectos, las competencias que cada parte retendría, su término y el mecanismo para dar por terminado el pacto en el caso de la estadidad, mayores precisiones en torno a la ley habilitadora, como también en el caso de la independencia, los elementos de transición a ser incluidos en un tratado entre los Estados Unidos y la República de Puerto Rico. En ambos casos, se debe considerar la creación de un tribunal especial para discutir asuntos y controversias que puedan surgir en la implantación de los tratados. El colegio pone a disposición de esta comisión sus recursos jurídicos, peritaje y asistencia. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. El próximo eh, está reconocido por cinco minutos. Good afternoon. My name is Héctor del Valle from Las Piedras, Puerto Rico. Dear Mr. Chairman and members of the Committee on Natural Resources, I'm a citizen who advocates 
for the integration of Puerto Rico as the 51st state of the Union. Unfortunately, a lot of U.S. citizens do not like the idea of Puerto Rico entering the Federation because they think that the island will become, quote, a paradise for welfare, end quote. I will analyze a myth that people believe about Puerto Rico's integration as a state as well as the solution. A quote, unquote, welfare paradise. The problem in Puerto Rico is that 60% of the population is below the poverty level. Everybody knows about that. Cause in part because the unemployment rate is more than 10%. If Puerto Rico becomes a state, the problem can be solved by applying the enterprise zones concept based on Jack Kemp's model. In Spanish, zonas empresariales federales. This will attract more industry into the island's economy and secure the United States supply chain a matter of national security, as we need a measure that will give industries in Puerto Rico a wage credit, for example, as an incentive to stay in the island and create more employment opportunities. That's, that is why right now I support the legislation on, me, on medical devices by Resident Commissioner Jennifer Gonzalez Colon. I am not for a welfare paradise concept, as some people say, and think about this. But when a state enters the union, it receives what it needs and gives to the USA Treasury what it can give the economic parity concept. It is obvious, however, that Puerto Rico will get more federal funds than nowadays as part of a taxation redefinition process, but it will go to the people that nowadays really need it, the elderly and the handicapped by means of the supplemental social security income, the veterans, and more Medicaid funds for the poor who need it. The legislation that was approved in the past on welfare report reform that was some years ago has had the object objective of stopping welfare dependency as a destructive lifestyle and is requiring able people to look for a decent work while giving appropriate daycare for single mothers. Puerto Ricans are American citizens since 1917, but second class citizens. We do not vote for the selection of the president, and we don't have vote. And we, don't have, we do not have voting congressmen. We only have our resident commissioner, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, who does not have a vote in Congress. Fellow congressmen, with my due respect, I think time has come for Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans, to choose their final destination, not to stay in political limbo any longer. I think this bill has definitely has to definitely solve the status problem once and for all. I support this initiative to solve this problem. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi should support this initiative too. I hope that after reading this statement, you will also continue to support the Puerto Rican Status Act, as well as the sole choice for statehood for the island. May God bless you. I also hope that you require to this, to this statement and request that the statement be admitted for the record. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Congresswoman, and all the people who are here. My name is Representative Jose Perez, Representative at Large. Um, I am here in substitution of one of my colleagues, Angel Morey, who is at home with COVID, so excuse him. As a strongly believer that we don't let spaces empty, I am here. And it's a great honor to have you in our beautiful island. <clears throat> I would like to recognize that the tremendous work that you have accomplished putting together the Puerto Rico Status Act draft. And it has been an effort on which all sides put their difference aside and find common ground and work together to solve once and for our interior con condition. It is not a small achievement. It is not an, an <clears throat> another consequence bill. It is a, the bill that will change our history forever. And you will be remembered as the brave men and women that end 
the colonial status of the United States citizens of Puerto Rico. It is really hard for me as an official elected try to make public policy when I know that we are under the plenary power of the Congress, that we don't have that equal representation, that we are now under the power and the decision of a group of people, the Fiscal Oversight Board management, that don't let us make that policy. And now they want to impose everything regarding our, our economic issues. It's really hard to do it. And it's really hard to think that now, right here in 21st century, we remain, as the some cases said, um, we Puerto Ricans, we are uh, belongs to, but we are not part of. What a shameful works for people, 3.2 million people who live on an island that deserve the same equal treatment. As a stakeholder supporter, I support this bill, and I know that all of you have worked together, putting aside, like I said, like I said at the beginning, many differences, but it is now the moment. It is now the moment to solve this. It is now the moment to let we, the Puerto Ricans, vote for the Commander-in-Chief who sends our soldiers to the war. We, we have many soldiers brave soldiers that fight for the democracy that we don't have right here on the island. This is unfair, and that's why we raise our voice to end this shameful situation of the status of Puerto Rico and have the same obligations, the same rights and privileges from the United States citizens who are living on the mainland. It is unfair, and let me put another example how unfair it is to have a fiscal oversight board management. Everybody's talking about climate change. Right here on the island, we're facing a lot of this problem regarding our coastal protections. And now, the government are trying to have the budget to have more than 200 people to make inspectors of the Department of the Natural Resources to apply and to enforce our environmental law. But now the Fiscal Oversight Management Board, they don't let to use that, the budget for that. This is another example of how unfair is our situation. We, the Puerto Ricans, have shoes three times to favor statehood. But now we are here again asking and thank you for your commitment to end the colonial status. Before me, there were a few panelists that were talking about unicorns. Let me say that. This audience, this comedy, this will that you have um, present to the people a few months ago was a unicorn. Now it is a reality. Our father of the Constitution says that all men are created equal. But decades ago, a woman, a black person, it was not considered on that statement. And now it's reality. So let's change this. Let's make together and work together Thank to you. end colonialism in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? It's my mic. Thank you for all uh, to having us here. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I uh, recognize especially our commissioner resident, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, and all the members of the Congress here. Uh, I want to speak uh, some in English and some in Spanish. Uh, Puerto Rico was besieged and occupied militarily by Caribes, pirates, and European powers. Since the time of colonizations from Christopher Columbus and Juan Ponce de Leon. And it had been 400 years of economic instability and little participation of the people 
until Foraker Act in 1900. Such was, such was the case that in 1874, an American paper published that Spain talked to cede the island of Puerto Rico to Germany as a payment for its help during a civil war. That's an example of how, how was the history of Puerto Rico under Spanish flag. But let's talk about Puerto Rico and the United States. It's important to note that hundreds of Puerto Rican Creoles in 1779 joined the Spanish army under General Bernardo Galvez and fought against the British in the American War of Independence. John Quincy Adams said, we would not be ashamed to recognize that our independence owns what our independence owns to the molasses of the Caribbean. This coalition of rights and equality that won in 1789 the independence of the United States lit the flame of democracy in Puerto Rican fighters who had to return to a monarchy regime in its own land. Something similar that is happening right now in Puerto Rico. We fight in other countries for the democracy of others and return to our land to be less under our, our own democracy. My father is a Korean war veteran. He was injured by a grenade defending the right of Koreans to be free. And he yet don't have the real democracy under the flag that he defended in that foreign country. But let's say something very important. The trip of Puerto Rico to the statehood, it didn't commence in 18. 98. The Foraker law said that Puerto Ricans, Puerto Rican, became a Republican government 52 years before the Estado Libre Asociado. It was a chamber, it was an executive branch, and a judiciary branch too. The Jones Act in its second article state that the rights and privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States shall be respected in Puerto Rico to the same degree as if Puerto Rico were a state of the union. That is stated in the Jones Act of 1917. Tengo ahora unas palabras finales. Tengo dos hijos, mi padre es un veterano, mi pueblo es la ciudad del Yunque, en Río Grande, Puerto Rico. Una tercera parte está bajo la jurisdicción del gobierno federal de los Estados Unidos. He escuchado aquí muchas cosas sobre la cultura, sobre el idioma, pero veo aquí frente a mí a una distinguida New Yorker, a dos distinguidas puertorriqueñas y a un descendiente mexicoamericano, dirigiendo una Comisión del Congreso de los Estados Unidos, mientras hay quien dice que Puerto Rico debe cuidar su cultura si fuéramos un Estado. Muchas gracias por escucharme. Gracias. Sir. I would like to thank Chairman Grijalba, distinguished members of Congress, Velázquez, González, and Ocasio Cortez for the opportunity to be before this committee. My name is Mario Jesus Toro Suriz, General Coordinator for the Autonomous Statehood Network of the Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana, a recently created progressive, people-powered, and community-centered political party in Puerto Rico. The Autonomous Statehood Network proudly represents the statehooders that have found a political home in the most progressive political party in Puerto Rico. We recognize that the most important development about the Puerto Rico Status Act 
consistent with the proposals made by Victoria Ciudadana is summarized in the following. That Congress offers a binding and self-executing process to decolonize that it only includes the three plausibly non-colonial, non-territorial options under the United States Constitution and international law. That it provides for an informed process where the people will know what each option entails and that it be the majority of the people freely choosing a winning option, an objective that is guaranteed with the run of mechanism. In the autonomous statehood network, we're satisfied with this consensus bill and wish to respond to some of the criticisms that have been raised. The consensus bill resolves the two main objectives of a constitutional status assembly. First, to commit Congress to act on the self-determination mandate emanating from Puerto Rican democracy by providing a binding and self-executing process that includes a formal offer of the options outside the territorial clause. And secondly, to bring together the anti-colonial forces in a procedural consensus with only non-colonial, non-territorial options on the ballot with the corresponding transitions in a federally endorsed process. The consensus bill cont contemplates a thorough, publicly financed educational campaign that is sufficient to combat any disinformation on the process and the status alternatives. We need there to be open, ample, and public deliberation with accurate information about the process so everyone can make a fully informed decision in the most transcendental election for Puerto Rico to date. But that is not to say that Puerto Ricans are not educated enough to make an informed decision, as some argue, in bad faith. We have been discussing the future political status of Puerto Rico since the United States first acquired the islands and before even as a colony of Spain. The time for talk should be concluding soon. The time for action is now. I want to make my final statement in Spanish if it's permitted. Absolutely. Dicho esto, la búsqueda por la descolonización de Puerto Rico ha durado múltiples siglos y ha tenido múltiples capítulos, múltiples puntos de vista, múltiples personajes. Pero con dos preguntas importantes siempre en mente. ¿Qué es lo mejor para nuestra gente y para nuestro país? Y segundo, ¿en qué momento vamos a tener un frente amplio de las diferentes fuerzas anticoloniales, independientemente del lado de la discusión política en que estén? para hacer un bien por el pueblo de Puerto Rico, dejar todas las diferencias y llevar a cabo finalmente la promesa de, te, de tomar nuestra propia decisión y a qué dirección vamos en el mundo. Puedo decir con mucha satisfacción que ese día llegó y estamos aquí atestiguándolo. Aquí habemos estadistas, aquí habemos independentistas, pero con un solo mensaje se tiene que acabar la tragedia que Puerto Rico ha sufrido durante más de cinco siglos, que es la colonia, y que hoy, a 70 años de su fundación, es el Estado Libre Asociado. No más. Esas son mis palabras, señor presidente. Muchas gracias. Sir. Buenas tardes al honorable comité y a todas y todos los presentes del público, incluyendo a los miembros de la prensa. My name is Francisco Amundaray. I was born in San Juan, where I also currently live. I work in the tourism sector as a tour guide and tourism consultant. I am one of various collaborators in Puerto Rico of the NGO Boricuas Unidos en la Diaspora. We see this project as a positive step towards a true decolonization process for my country, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an intervene nation which has never been assimilated by the U.S. We are a Latin American and Caribbean country, not just an island that happens to be inhabited by U.S. citizens. The process considered here should be slow and careful and always looking to have a broad participation of all civil society in Puerto Rico. Historically, Puerto Rico's status discussion has been kidnapped by the pro-annexation party and the pro-colonial Commonwealth party, severely affecting the perception of the people towards independence and towards free association. To make matters worse, 
the independence movement has been historically persecuted by the FBI, the CIA, and the Puerto Rican police. To be truly democratic and fair, the Puerto Rican people need to have all true facts at hand. Not only the classic political parties should participate, but also community, environmental, the LGBTQI um, community, NGOs, small businesses, the scientific community, feminist groups, labor union, sports, and nonpartisan political organizations, and very important, the two island municipalities of Vieques and Culebra. The people who compose the Puerto Rican nation have very different circumstances in their lives, depending on where they live. The necessities of a t-shirt uh, of a t-shirt that is also a single mother living in the suburbs of Bayamon are not the same of a coffee farmer in the mountainside town of Maricao or of a fisherman in the island municipality of Vieques. On this draft, once this draft becomes a law project, it needs to have numerous public hearings both in Washington DC and in Puerto Rico. Important points. The definition of statehood has to be more deeply discussed, especially in its economic uh, consequences. What is going to happen with language uh, in the courts and in schools? What will happen to our Ol Olympic national team and the participation of Puerto Rico in regional meetings? The proposed transition plan for statehood is not realistic and is not supported by historical events of states of the union before their final admission as a formal part of your country. On the other hand, a bill that will compromise a future Congress by admitting the colony of Puerto Rico as a state is doomed to fail. So language in that sense should be eliminated. Also, Puerto Ricans should be clarified in the sense that statehood is a concession, not a right. On the other hand, independence is an international, in, internationally inalienable right. It is our opinion that if 51% Puerto Ricans want any of the two forms of sovereignty, a transition process should be immediately started following international law. Nonetheless, the statehood admission should require an 80% or more supermajority since statehood is irreversible and Puerto Rico as a nation will stop existing. Concerning the diaspora, there are 5 million Puerto Rican living in the United States. They should also be part, at least, of the discussion of a binding plebiscite. A committee should be created to explore how to include them. Concerning this particular event that takes place today, I respectfully ask that in the future, more time should have been given to the Puerto Rican society to, pre to prepare to then participate. In the website, the speaking option was not, never open. The independence movement has many organizations that were not invited, and in a future occasion, they should be here to truly have an inclusive process. I also respectfully ask you to please communicate to your fellow congressmen and congresswomen that not all Puerto Ricans want to be part of your country. Gracias por su tiempo y atención. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any, question, any questions for the panelists? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, before, as I invite the, the next group up, let me uh, say that, uh, that, anyone, that anyone can submit comments to the committee. Uh, our website is naturalresources.house.gov. Uh, and uh, there's comment cards and information in the back of the room. Uh, we welcome all of them. Thank you.
is the last panel, so I'm going to go Alexander, Jennifer, you close if you want to. Huh? So I think. Wait, wait. Let's go to the. So what, what the, so, so what have I done? You don't care? No, do you, you know, te lo, te lo llamo. Oh, okay. Yeah, no quiero. We just hear them all and we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Por favor. Sir, Caballero. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congresswoman Velasquez, Congresswoman Ocasio. Nice to see you again. <laughs> well, I thank you all as I thank you yesterday. Thank you for this opportunity. I would like to elaborate on, on a point that I, that in my view is critical to this discussion. The issue of democracy and democratic values and the historical repercussions of the process that this committee had set in motion. We live in a democratic society, in a country that prides itself to be the beacon of freedom and democracy, democracy for all. This point is so important to understand because every day we watch people from all over the world trying to get across, to get access to the liberties that we all take for granted. Democracy is not perfect. And from time to time, from, and from time to time, it may be threatened by forces who make a living from inequality and discrimination. That's the people that we are fighting against. That's the same people that will move mountains to try to shake this committee down, to try to stop this agreement from becoming the law of the land. Believe me when I say that there are forces here on this room, within this room, that hopefully they are, are trying to stop these proceedings. You have seen them, and you will hear from them, not only in Puerto Rico, but also in Washington. That's what this committee uh, will face. And from time, and from what I've seen, they will not succeed. You know, the historical ramifications of this agreement are unprecedented. As I'm sure its results will also be unprecedented. This process is being designed in such a way that it would set an example for the world to follow. That's why the territorial or colonial options cannot be part of the solution. You know, in order to a great point. have a process great point. that actually makes sense, you know, that process cannot include the problem. Because if there's no problem, why are we here? Why are we having this discussion at this time? Why this committee has uh, you know, invested so much time and effort and have had the opportunity to get the input, to take the input of so many people? Why are they interested? Why are they interested if there's not a problem? The fact of the matter is that the status that we have is a problem. The fact of the matter is that it was rejected by the people of, the, of Puerto Rico, and it should not be on the ballot. And whatever this committee finally adopts and passes, I'm sure that this agreement, it, it will, you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's going to be something that 
it will be a model for the world to follow. Because this, that, that's who we are. That's what this community is all about. So finally, I would argue and I would challenge this committee to rise up to the challenge, rise up to the moment. I know that you're doing, that you actually did. You know, the fact of the matter that we are here discussing this, you know, a few months ago, no one would have expected that. And, and I know, because I talked to you just yesterday, Congresswoman, you do understand the historical repercussions of this, actually, this, of this moment, because this is history in the making. And thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And hopefully, we can actually pass a bill that, you know, let the Puerto Rican people finally choose in a binding referendum, what we actually decide to be. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir? Saludos. Eh, Saludos. Mi nombre es Pedro Daniel Rodríguez Mercado. Gracias a toda la audiencia que nos está viendo y a ustedes por estar aquí. Um, I'm the executive director of the Young Professionals for Puerto Rico Statehood. And it's very evident that I'm not Albert Einstein nor Abraham Lincoln <laughs> or any other brilliant person you have listened to today. There's nothing. I may say today that has not been mentioned before, so I'll be as brief, brief as possible. There's only one statement I want to make clear on behalf of the youth I represent. But for Pedro Rosselló, this issue is complex. The historical baggage is heavy. Opinions on the subject are many, varied, and passionately held. Bridging the divide is how we bring forward positive change to this world, and for this, we thank you. This El Estado Libre Asociado did not change our colonial status, which has been the root cause of most of our problems for half a millennium. And as long as Puerto Rico's status is not solved, we won't be able to focus on other important matters to advance society and drive positive change in this world. I grew up in a house divided against itself, with my mom's side being pro-statehood and my dad's side being pro-independence. My dad used to repeat <clears throat> some words of, uh, similar to Pedro Albizu Campos. The youth must defend their country with weapons of knowledge. And that is precisely why we're here today. The youth is clear, <clears throat> and their country and, and that the opposition would prolong this debate forever if they could, because their intention is not to move forward with the majority's desire but to maintain the failing status quo. This consensus bill is meant to end the longest colony in the history of the world. And the only way decolonization via self-determination can be achieved is by not including the current colonial status in the plebiscite and by making the result a binding one. It is time to move this bill as is to conclude America's unfinished business of democracy a guarantee, uh, and guarantee that the future generations live to see 51 stars united as one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Y quiero decir unas palabras rápido. Ser bilingüe, hablar inglés y español, no me hace menos boricua. Soy estadista y sería borincano aunque naciera en la luna. Gracias. Gracias. The floor is yours. Uh, Chairman Gruheva, Congresswoman Velasquez and Ocasio, and distinguished guests participating in this forum, I am honored to be here today to share my views on the discussion draft of, of the Puerto Rico Status Act. My name is former Senator Lucy Arce, and I'm here to, uh, in representation of Puerto Rico Escogio Estadidad a nonpartisan grassroots nonprofit organization that advocates for the recognition that the majority of Puerto Rico voters have already chosen statehood for Puerto Rico. I want to start by expressing my sincere gratitude for all of the effort that you have made to develop this compromise bill. Although I continue to support HR 1522, I'm also proud to state my support for the Puerto Rico Status Act. 
As a lifelong advocate of statehood, I support this compromise bill because it respects the will of the majority of Puerto Rico voters who have chosen statehood in 2012, 2017, and 2020. This bill does this by making a formal offer of statehood for Puerto Rico and then providing a mechanism for its implementation if the majority of voters should it once again. The bill also offers voters the, the non-territorial option of independence and free association. This is critical because the people of Puerto Rico have repeatedly expressed their desire to end the current territorial status and Congress must provide us clear and constitutionally viable choices. The compromise bill does it. And for the first time ever, would represent a commitment for, by Congress to implement it, the choice made by voters in Puerto Rico. I also commend the compromise bill for opening, offering voters only non-territorial option. The problem cannot be part of the solution. So please, hold strong on this aspect of the compromise bill. Anyone who knows me know of my commitment to Puerto Rico veterans. This bill offers our veterans and their families the opportunity to vote for full equality and voting rights as U.S. citizens which our veterans have earned through their service and sacrifice. As a former member of Puerto Rico Senate, I know how hard reaching a legislative compromise can be. And I know that once an agreement is reached, making any changes to it could cause the agreement to fall apart. So even though I will offer suggestions for the bill's improvement, I am more than willing to accept the compromise bill as current draft if that will allow the bill to have a chance to pass Congress and become law. That being said, I will urge the committee to consider amending the option of sovereignty free association to independence in free association. I offer this suggestion because it is critical that voters understand that the choice they would make with free association means they would exit the protection of the U.S. Constitution and the Puerto Rico's relationship with the United States under that ocean will only be based on a treaty that can be terminated by either side in favor of independence. Using the word independence before free association would make the implication of the monumental change more clear to voters that the use of the word sovereignty, whose meaning is less clear and more ambiguous. This is necessary to ensure that Puerto Rico voters provide informed concern and are not misled into voting for a status option that remains Puerto Rico from the protection of the United States Constitution without them being fully aware of what it is if what they are choosing. I too want to say that after 124 years under the US flag with this bill, Congress has finally recognized that the current territorial status represents an inherent limitation for Puerto Rico development. Now we need your leadership to get this bill go through the legislative process before the current window of opportunity draws to a close. We will continue our citizen advocacy efforts, but look to you to do everything in your power to make this bill become a law so Puerto Rico can finally bloom into its potential of democracy, equality, and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of this distinguished committee and my fellow Americans. I'm Josue Rivera a public servant, former city director for Puerto Rico at the U.S. Department of Act, Rural Development, former policy advisor of the Office of the Governor in Washington, 
former national president of the Borges State Student Association, current Ideas Fellow of the Aspen Institute. But for the record, I'm not here in any of these official capacities, but rather as a private citizen concerned about Puerto Rico political and economic future. There is a saying that goes as follows, it is better late than never. Therefore, please accept my sincere appreciation to all the parties involved in reaching this historic agreement. Your leadership and detachment in finding common ground is, without doubt, key to resolving long overdue colonial relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico. We all know that the common ground here in Puerto Rico is that we, Puerto Ricanos, treasure our American citizenship, the Constitution, our love for freedom, the pursuit of happiness, our belief that all men are created equal, and we cherish our multicultural, multilingual link between mainstream America and our Puerto Rican culture. Therefore, yo soy Boricua and American, pa que tú lo sepa. A statehood does not change that, but the two other options of independence will. I come here in support of H.R. 1522, the Puerto Rico Statehood Admission Act, and the draft bill, the Puerto Rico Status Act which provide the American citizens residing in Puerto Rico a process to exercise our right to self-determination, this time through a binding self-executing process initiated by federal sponsored legislation. The American flag has flown over Puerto Rico since 1898. In 1900, Congress established a civilian government on the island through the Forker Act. In 1901, the Supreme Court struck this act with Downs and versus Big Will decision, and its progeny held for the Constitution and Reforming Clause, Puerto Rico was not part of the United States and was subject to the plenary powers of Congress, which turned into a colonial relationship ever since. Congress needs to act with a sense of urgency. Then in 1950, Congress passed Public Law 81600, the Puerto Rico Federal Relations Act, and still with the passage of Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act of 2016, better known as PROMESA, and recent Supreme Court determination, such as United States versus Bayo Madero. Once again, Congress and the Supreme Court remind us all the centennial colonial relationship is still present and pending resolution. I strongly support the mission of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico as a state of the Union. It is the best path forward given that we have a relationship for over 120 years, a relationship that binds the U.S. and Puerto Rico by sharing and benefiting from the economic, cultural, political, and societal aspiration of our people. I am concerned about the educational campaign for the other two options of independence included, included in the draft bill. As a clear reminder, independence has never been an option favored by most of the people in Puerto Rico. As evidenced by all local places I held up at this point, this Congress needs to address many important questions about the two forms of independence and instruct the executive branch of the U.S. government on how we will effectively transition the over 10,000 federal civilian employees and thousands of military service members, including their families. Second, estimate the cost of transition. Are we going to fire them? Third, there's need to be an estimate of impact and cost for the resident of the Republic of Puerto Rico and the implications of ending federal programs that currently benefit our most vulnerable, our low-income communities, our women, our children, our elders, veterans, and socially disadvantaged small businesses in Puerto Rico. Fourth, what is the cost of the new nation defense? What is the cost of admission to the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and many other institutional regulating bodies? What are the process and implications establishing currency, federal insurance for natural resources, taxation, managing current and future debt obligations? How many embassies will Puerto Rico have and what will be the cost to the people of Puerto Rico? What happened to its best investment certainty and the economic market risk? Fit, what will be the U.S. citizens' current benefit and responsibility loss with the two independence options? And I'm also concerned that the two options of independence will continue to sponsor citizenship for the residents. That's against the United States Constitution and our national interests. Citizens living in the nation under COFA are regarded as national. Therefore, I'm proposing an immediate transition to U.S. nationals status for all residents of Puerto Rico in these two types of independence. Concerning the legislative process, I urge you to advance this proposal, the Puerto Rico Status Act, and in my opinion, the best path forward 
for the people of Puerto Rico and statehood, okay. but I invite all the parties to Thank join you. us in support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Thank you. Sir? Hi, good evening. Uh, muchas gracias, uh, Chairman Grijalva. And y un saludo a su gente hermosa de Tucson. Gracias. Nogales y el desierto de Sonora. It's a very beautiful area. I've been, Thank I've you. been there in the past. Y un saludo a nuestras tres boricuas <laughs> que nos representan en el Congreso. Two of them are here. I'm as a progressive, progressive Democrat. I'm proud of you and the way you do in Congress. And just a side note, I've been observing the way you, Alexandra, uh, pay attention to what the people are saying. We, the common people, appreciate that. Thank you. I am a, I'm Humberto Marchan. I'm a retired federal probation officer, career federal probation officer, and a correctional psychologist. So as a progressive Democrat, I will address you from that framework. Puerto Rico is a nation, culturally, soci sociologically, and anthropologically. Sovereignty is an inherent, inalienable right of any nation, regardless of how people vote. Saying that, after almost 125 years as a US colony, and 400 years as a colony of Spain, I believe that the best path for Puerto Rico to transition to a sovereign nation is Libre Asociación, Free Association. I congratulate the committee for taking the morally righteous decision to include this path as a logical step to decolonize Puerto Rico. The transition mechanisms, agreements toward national sovereignty via free association or full independence is a recognition that the colonial oppression to us, Puerto Ricans, whether it be in the island, in the mainland, or anywhere else in the world, deserves a responsible and restorative, restorative process by the colonial power. The most recent example of this responsible and peaceful transitional process is England and Barbados. Please take us time to study this example as a way to improve the bill. U.S. citizenship in this transition process is the most significant component from the, from the perspective of this restorative and moral obligation. It is, it is a great step by this committee to put U.S. citizenship as a central aspect of this transition. Our colonial history has deep-rooted myths and disinformation with regards to U.S. citizenship. Therefore, the bill needs as most detailed clarification in, the matter, in this matter of U.S. citizenship to eliminate ambiguity and misinterpretation. From my view, now in the 21st century, common citizenship agreement, double, triple citizenships, is the norm, and the bill should reflect that. That's the way we live now in the world. We have to have a 360 vision of the world. Now to the state of option. Hawaii is the only island archipelago state. We all know that. This, bring me, this brings me to our closest neighbors, fellow U.S. citizens of the U.S. non-incorporated territory of the Virgin Islands, which is actually the most southern U.S. hole in the world. It's not Puerto Rico. Again, 360 division, as a good friend and, and colleague from the U.S. Virgin Islands once told me. Um, we have more U.S. citizens living in these two Caribbean colonies than about 30 states. Figure that out, than 30 states. If statehood is to be seriously considered by U.S. Congress, the moral path is to have these two Caribbean colonies join as the second archipelago state. Mm -hmm. It is the right and moral path to statehood for the most that for the almost three and a half million U.S. citizens that call the Caribbean their homeland. Together, they will have two U.S. senators, about five or six congressional districts, hopefully Democrats, because I'm a Democrat. Now, this will be a serious and consequential commitment to finally end U.S. colonialism in the Caribbean. At last, I just want to thank the committee for moving forward in a serious and courageous effort to end our current colonial condition. At last, I want to highlight the fact that we had three Puerto Rican women as part of this commitment in this committee, 
and they have taken up the, a leading role in this process and have shown to us the capacity to sit down and dialogue to achieve compromise. No, no offense to you, Mr. Grijalva, but we want to recognize that. No offense taken. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great example to our people, but as a parent of a daughter, you serve as a great role model to our daughters. That's all, that's all I you. have to say. And I, I, I do want to say, I know, I know the binding clause is, is the right thing on principle. But I think in the political environment right now, especially on the Republican side, it was going to have problems because. OK, thank you very much. They don't want, OK, I'm done. Sir? Thank you, Mr. Grijalba. Someone said something ago in these panels that uh, we're equal Hispanic and that that's going to bring a lot of trouble. And I just recall the history of New Mexico and Arizona being part of California and then being part of uh, Mexico and now being both different states. So I just wanted to bring the point that uh, being Hispanic is part of the multiculturalism that the United States uh, is enhancing uh, in all venues. Uh, let me say to start that I believe in the character and the work being done by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I follow her in Twitter. Uh, also, Nia Velázquez, which I met many years ago with Álvaro Cifuentes in, in his chief of staff office. And obviously Jennifer, our friend. Uh, Mr. Grijalva is the newcomer, and you are welcome because you have demonstrated that you are more bilingual than many of us. And that's a true example of what the Puerto Rico could do uh, in the United States as part of the, of the coalition of the different people. And uh, that way, uh, some people won't lose their pensions uh, for working in other places. So I'm going to say a few words I don't think to consume all the time. On these specifics, because so many people are talking about the legalities of this and that, and there are so many experts that I get confused. I, I don't represent any group other than the young guys from my age. And uh, I tend to look for, for taxes and things like that because I'm a CPA on my own. So, uh, and also on accounting. On accounting of the votes on section three, section five, eight, three. Uh, it says that you have to, the valid votes are cast. And on, on item B1, it talks about the valid votes. If, if you exclude the blank votes and the nullified votes, somehow you come out with a number. So you're making the accounting anyway. So just for you to know that there's an accounting that people is going to use as, a, as an argument after the, the, the votes are casted. Uh, I wanted you to, to become aware that the Puerto Rico Electoral Commission uh, is in a financial crisis, an administrative crisis, and that I personally don't think I got you. I got you. it will run the process That's unless okay. it's being overhauled. The Electoral Commission has a projected deficit for the past few yep. years. They have a mess inside. I know it because I worked there for a year. So I can tell you, they're going to burn me, but I can tell you that you have to devote some time to put their act together so that they can do the, the job. I think another panelist brought this topic uh, this morning. And there is no mention for FEMA and CDBG extraordinary funds for, as a consequence of Maria. Uh, the law doesn't, the project or the draft doesn't say what's going to happen on independence, what's going to happen on statehood. I think you, have, you should, should look for that. Uh, on statehood, there is no adjustment for uh, SSI for the people who are not making the, the, the payment uh, while they have been claimed for many years. Same thing happens with the pension of the veterans that are being uh, calculated based on, on a non-continental resident. And that has to be taken for. There's no phase in of the tax liability 
uh, you are proposing some incentive for, for independence and giving some extra funds uh, on a huge amount as a block grant, but you are not proposing any incentives for the people of Puerto Rico if we could become, as I expect, a state uh, to face in the tax liability and also to promote economic development using zones or some, some, something like that. And, and then uh, why for me, in my personal basis, it is important because I have a, I have a grandson living in, in the Panhandle and their father cannot come to Puerto Rico because he is a six times Afghanistan active duty veteran and he needs some special Okay. Health treatment and Puerto Rico Hospital, Veteran Hospital doesn't provide yeah. those. So, thank you. Respecto is submitted, uh, I will include a, a paper later on in the night. Thank Pre you. Appreciate that, sir. And uh, your point is something that is our collective mind having to do with the importance if we get to the point of an election, the integrity and the sanctity of that election is going to be vital uh, to the confidence and trust that we have that that election will have among the Puerto Rican people. We're aware of that and, and dealing with that. Sir? Saludos cordiales a todos. Mi nombre es Nixon Rosado Vélez. Vivo en el pueblo de Vega Baja. At the age of 10, my parents came from Brooklyn. And uh, I love this island. I met my wife. We've been married 39 years. I see uh, the young congresswoman, and I see my daughter. And to Mrs. Uh, Congresswoman Velasquez, uh, we're related, distantly, but we are. Uh, maybe someday I'll let you know. Uh, <laughs> maybe ahorita. Ahorita. And Ahora. Ahora. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, again, my name is Nixon Rosado Velez. I served 23 years active military let me in the United States let me Army. I retired as a CW4. I understand that federal taxes and Puerto Rico taxes will have changes if we become a state. It has to happen. All these IRS codes and, and, and Código de Renta Interna and Hacienda would have to be, make changes. I pay federal taxes. I pay local taxes. But I cannot vote for the President of the United States, and I do not have proper representation in Congress, with the exception of Jennifer Gonzalez, who I have met. We currently have 350,000 Puerto Ricans as veterans. On this island 10 years ago, we had 145,000. Today, that number is at 83,000. They are moving up north. We have 35,000 active duty military members, 10,000 National Guards and reservists. What will happen to our VA hospital and our VA services if this is not a state and, then you take, and we have a different option uh, of uh, uh, libre asociación or independence. That is a great concern. As a federal taxpayer, and as stated before, I cannot, I cannot uh, overemphasize this. We are second class citizens. We have to move up north in order to have those full rights. The people of Puerto Rico on this island pay $5 billion in different types of federal taxes. Social Security, Medicare, unemployment, and customs, just to name a few. Yet we don't receive this fair amount that other states do. The other thing that we have as a problem is with paying taxes, we pay more taxes than six other states in the union. My father came from Las Piedras, Puerto Rico. At the age of 15, he moved to the states to pick tomatoes and lettuce. He had a saying, he would, say, he would tell me, de orgullo, el hombre se muere de hambre. Y me decía, lo que pasa que tú no sabes el dolor de hambre. I went on a 51-hour hunger strike in Washington, D.C., in favor of statehood. And I know what that pain is, because I have hunger for statehood. The draft is a historical one. It comes from Congress. No more excuses. We have always been told that we don't that they don't want us, but we don't know who they are. With this bill, we will know on the no votes who they are. I ask for one thing, take it to the floor. Even if we do lose, we have won, because this has never happened before. 
I asked the Senate to do the same thing. Because even if we lose in the Senate, we still win. Perdiendo, aún ganamos. Because it's a historical event. That's pretty good. In this type of bill, we only need a simple majority. Not a super majority like others think. The Constitution has a term for new states. It's called equal footing. So to treat us differently than any other states, which didn't require a supermajority to become states, would be wrong. It would be undemocratic not to treat Puerto Rico in the same manner as other states. I say it would be unpatriotic for anyone voting no on American citizens that want to be part of this great nation and union. Just want to state, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. And to uh, uh, Congresswoman Velasquez, my grandfather and your father were cousins. Mm. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. Padecite, hello. Thank you very much, sir. Gracias, señor Raul Grijalva. Nidia. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Y usted también, buenas tardes. Alexandro Casio. Jennifer, me faltó. Me hubiera gustado que estuviera. Eh, sé que están cansados, yo también. Porque yo llegué temprano. Pero vamos adelante a ver si terminamos esto con mucho gusto. Muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Cristóbal Berríos. Dávila, presidente del SENA. Congreso Estadista Nacional Americano. Esta organización fue creada a raíz de la celebración de unas vistas del Comité de Recursos de la Cámara del Proyecto 4751 del representante John T. Dulite del 4 de octubre del año 2000, donde se presentaba el proyecto de libre asociación del Partido Popular Democrático que fue eliminado por constitución inconstitucional. Me permito informarle que he estado integrado a la política puertorriqueña desde 1954. He participado como director creativo, compositor, publicista, productor, a pesar de que mi principal trabajo fue de comediante, como mi querido amigo Zelensky, sin ánimo de desear compararme con alguien a quien admiro entrañablemente. Agradecemos la oportunidad de poder expresarnos en este asunto tan importante para todos los residentes en esta bella isla, especialmente los que no han podido llegar a alcanzar una vida de disfrute pleno por la condición económica precaria, resultado de un sistema económico de consumo esclavista que posee un sistema de gobierno creado por el Congreso que no ha funcionado manteniéndolo al borde de una quiebra y que obliga al puertorriqueño a depender de unas ayudas que la mayor parte de las veces no le llega. Nosotros representamos hoy ese, el mayor sector de los residentes de Puerto Rico, incluyendo una gran cantidad de hermanos de otros países que decidieron acompañarnos en nuestro peregrinar al futuro y viven en esta isla posesión de los Estados Unidos, pero que no somos parte con la esperanza de que algún día se resuelva nuestro estatus colonial. Yo quiero decirle que hay una frase famosa que dice que si los hombres no van a arreglar el mundo, lo arreglarán las mujeres. Y yo veo un grupo grande de mujeres aquí, así es que espero que eso suceda. <risa> Puerto Rico puede ser soberano de dos maneras. Puede ser soberano como una república independiente, como puede ser soberano como un estado. El estado soberano de Hawái, el estado soberano de New York, el estado soberano de Puerto Rico. Casi al final de la guerra, de los, de, de la guerra hispanoamericana, con la llegada del general Miles y los las tropas americanas a Puerto Rico. Algunos puertorriqueños pensaron que el Congreso de Estados Unidos haría con Puerto Rico lo mismo que con otros territorios, 
que fueron incorporados y convertidos en Estado. Desgraciadamente estábamos muy lejos, pero muy lejos de eso. La firma del Tratado de París, el artículo número 9, nos pone a nosotros esclavos del Congreso. Esclavos. El artículo 9 dice la condición política y los derechos de los que viven en los territorios los determina el Congreso. Nosotros no tenemos ningún poder somos esclavos del Congreso. Por eso no, no importa lo que nosotros vamos a sugerir, porque el Congreso hará lo que quiera. Pero creo que el esfuerzo vale la pena. Creo que están haciendo un gran trabajo, un gran trabajo. Por primera vez veo yo una posibilidad de que Puerto Rico cambie su estatus, sea el que sea, sea el que sea. Puerto Rico es hoy es el reflejo de un pueblo que en su momento no supo decidir el reclamar lo que le correspondía por derecho y respeto, su estatus no colonial y no territorial, como un Estado 51 de la gran nación americana en el año 2012. Las ambiciones personales de algunos lo evitaron. No, no. Los tres partidos políticos se han convertido en agencias de empleo en lugar de servidores públicos. Algunos políticos de carrera se las agencian elección tras elección para no quedarse sin trabajo. Un ejemplo de ello fue un legislador que vivió del pueblo por lo menos 40 años. Bueno, señor, si me permite... No lo digo. Bye. <risa> Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a todos ustedes. Si hay de mis colegas, si hay alguna pregunta... Si no, muchísimas gracias. Muy uh, Before uh, we uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we end up, we close this session. Uh, let me uh, ask my colleagues uh, on the dais if uh, they have any comments they would like to make before we uh, conclude uh, gavel the meeting. Thank you. Congresswoman. Of course. Muchas gracias, congresistas Velázquez Grijalva y González Colón por su colaboración en este proyecto. Yo quiero dar las gracias a todos ustedes aquí por su participación y por expresar sus pensamientos y preocupaciones sobre este borrador. Sus comentarios son esenciales para asegurar que esta propuesta refleje la voluntad de la gente. Y es importante que los congresistas realizamos más audiencias públicas cuando lleguemos a Washington, D.C. Durante más de 100 años, el territorio estadounidense de Puerto Rico ha estado sujeto a políticas impuestas por un congreso frecuentemente desinteresado en el bienestar de quienes viven aquí. Esta realidad toca todos los aspectos de la vida de los puertorriqueños. Puerto Rico recibe un trato desigual para el reembolso de Medicaid, el apoyo nutricional y una serie de otros programas de redes de seguridad, a pesar de ser más pobre que el estado más pobre, Mississippi. Además, nuestra gente todavía está sintiendo la devastación de, del huracán María. Estos problemas y otras se, deri se derivan el estatus colonial único y de larga data de Puerto Rico, que ha resultado en que los residentes de la isla sean tratados como ciudadanos de segunda clase. Sin duda, creemos que Puerto Rico debe tener la libertad de diseñar su propio futuro. En esta propuesta hay tres opciones que la gente de Puerto Rico puede votar. La primera es independencia. La segunda, soberanía con libre asociación de los Estados Unidos. Y la tercera es categoría de Estado. El Congreso imponiendo cualquier estatus a Puerto Rico sería la culminación de la colonización. Esta legislación debe ser objetivo al resultado. Organizaciones comunitarias han defendido un proceso de descolonización democrática para Puerto Rico y han superado poderosos intereses. 
Es la, es la rep, responsabilidad del gobierno federal a permitir que la población del territorio exprese libremente sus deseos con respecto al estatus político. Esta propuesta son, nos trae un paso más cerca a terminar con 520 años del colonialismo. Con el estatus de Puerto Rico, aún más de a 535 miembros del Congreso a los Estados Unidos, ahora también es más claro que nunca que la isla debe tener la libertad de determinar su propio futuro. Por eso, apoyo un proceso transparente, justo y incluyente para que el pueblo decida. Es imperativo que cualquier elección esté libre de es, es imperativo que cualquier elección esté libre de corrupción, dinero con intereses privada y desinformación. Cada votante debe tener toda la información necesaria para emitir un voto informado sobre las tres opciones y lo que cada opción implica en términos de repercusiones legales, económicas y sociales. Lo más importante es que el pueblo de Puerto Rico reconoce esta elección como legítima y justa para respetar el resultado. Y eso es lo que todos nosotros como miembros del Congreso debemos asegurar. Nuestro papel es garantizar que, le, que esta legislación sea justa y equilibrada. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Ms. Velasco. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Ha sido un día largo, ha sido una semana de muchas uh, reuniones. Hemos querido darle participación amplia a todos los puertorriqueños que quieran expresarse. Como ustedes saben, es, el borrador está en el website del Comité de Recursos Naturales, que obviamente cualquier comentario, sugerencia, va a estar en el récord, así que nosotros continuamos invitando a todos los puertorriqueños para que se expresen. Este es un momento eh, muy emotivo para todos nosotros. Esto no es un, un business más. Esto es el futuro de un pueblo. Esto es el reconocimiento de la responsabilidad moral de miembros puertorriqueños que estamos en el Congreso y que nos toca a nosotros llevar básicamente eh, la bandera de echar y empujar la discusión sobre Puerto Rico en el Congreso. Esto no ha sido fácil. La falta de claridad y la falta de educarse, el imperio que ha mantenido una colonia por 122 años, Ustedes no pueden imaginarse cómo es el ejercicio de tratar de capturar la atención de congresistas que fueron electos por sus respectivos distritos y que para ellos lo más importante es representar a sus distritos. Puerto Rico siempre ha sido un asterisco y nosotros le hemos recordado todos los días la responsabilidad moral que tienen. No podemos estar dando lecturas de democracia a otras partes del mundo y fallarle a casi nueve millones de puertorriqueños. Por eso eh, estamos comprometidos no solamente a empujar este debate, pero para nosotros es sumamente importante de que se le provea la información, de que hayan definiciones claras porque esto es para ustedes y sus hijos las futuras generaciones. Y además, una cosa muy importante que Alexandria ha levantado y que lo hemos discutido a través de todas estas negociaciones, la falta de fe en las instituciones puertorriqueñas. O sea, hay que garantizarle al puertorriqueño que cuando usted va a ejercer un voto, que ese voto se va a contar. Hay que asegurar y garantizar de que haya transparencia en el proceso, 
de que se le provean los recursos a cada una de las facciones que van a participar para que ustedes puedan llevar a cabo una campaña que sea efectiva y que nadie tenga ventajas sobre ninguna otra persona o ninguno otro de los partidos políticos o lo que fuera. Ese es nuestro compromiso con ustedes. Ayúdennos a nosotros para llegar al momento final de una vez y por todas resolver un hecho, un problema, un issue que separa y divide a la familia puertorriqueña. Que Dios los bendiga. Gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias a, a todos que participaron, a los que van a participar uh, en términos de darnos su información, sus recomendaciones, etcétera. Pero también les quiero dar las gracias a mis tres colegas. Uh, el uh, liderazgo y el valor uh, de las tres ha sido el, pun el empuje, el punto clave de toda esta discusión y, el y por eso estamos aquí este día y le quiero dar las gracias. Mira, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't claim to um, share the experience of Puerto Ricans on this island in terms of our shared citizenship. Uh, mis antepasados en una guerra que perdieron con los Estados Unidos dieron su, perdieron su terreno. Mis antepasados indígenas perdieron casi todo. Y esa experiencia, la, lo que tenemos en comú, común es uh, ese odio a la igualdad, the lack of equality. It's a shared fight. And it's a shared fight for all Americans. And uh, so those are colonial legacies that we can't change. But lo que veo aquí en Puerto Rico, con este documento tan importante y histórico, es la oportunidad de cambiar, to change that legacy. That's my commitment. That's my commitment to my colleagues, and, and we go forward with hard work ahead, but with the expectation that we will uh, we'll move this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Thank you, love. Okay,